Well, fame is fleeting, as they always <laughs> say. Time is fleeting, and Rhonda and I will be back to wrap things up here at the ESPN Sports Center right after this final timeout. <laughs> National Football League Collegiate Player Draft. Who will follow in the footsteps of Ricky Bell, who went to Tampa Bay during the year 1977? Earl Campbell, who went to Houston in 78? Tom Cousineau, who decided to go north to Canada in 79? Billy Kane, who went to Detroit in 80? Who will be number one in 81? Let's find out as ESPN presents the NFL Draft. presents the 1981 National Football League Draft. Brought to you by Hilton Hotels Corporation. When American business hits the road, American business stops at Hilton. America's business address. And by Natural Light Beer. Taste is why you'll switch to Natural Light. You're looking at the floor of the Grand Ballroom of the Sheraton Hotel in New York City, where for the next eight and one half hours, history will be made. We start the 1981 National Football League season. We've been talking a lot about it in recent weeks and recent months. And in fact, a lot of work has been done during the past a couple of months towards developing the 1981 National Football League Collegiate Player Draft. We know who the big names are. We know who the big athletes are. We know what is expected. We know the names of Rodgers, Taylor, and the like are expected to go near the top of the round. But what is unexpected? That's going to be a good portion of the story during the course of the next eight and a half hours. From here at the Sheraton in New York City, from Oakland, we'll, we'll be reporting on what's transpiring there and also from our broadcast center. Bob Lee is standing by at our broadcast center right now to take a look at what will most likely be the top picks of this 1981 National Football League Collegiate Player Draft. Thank you, George, and there's very little doubt that the 1981 season does begin today. Bud Wilkinson, the team's plan, they get the computers out, the budget's out, it all begins today, even though the exhibition season is months away. Well, what happens today will determine the future of the team this year to a degree, but more importantly, two or three or four years from now, from the player standpoint, where they're drafted relates to how much money they're going to make. Paul McGuire, there's pretty much universal agreement that this draft is solid through four rounds, very deep this year. They're deep at linebacker, they're deep at defensive back. But I think the one thing, Bob, that people are overlooking is the fact that they are extremely deep in quarterbacks. And it was announced yesterday, I believe, that Dave Wilson of Illinois is available in this draft. And that might throw a monkey wrench into some things. It'll make the strategy very interesting, especially as far as the Rams <laughs> are concerned early on. Howard Balls is in the Sporting News. Your selection for the top three picks. We've heard about whether the Jets will make a move or not, but who are the top three picks in your mind? Well, I'm waiting for Bum Phillips to go against the grain and... Uh, and throw everything off, but he'll probably select George Wa Rogers. I think the Giants will then select North Carolina linebacker Lawrence Taylor, and then the Jets, if they hold on to that pick, will probably select UCLA running back Freeman McNeil. Well, let's focus in now on those uh, first three selections as you have uh, picked them. The Heisman Trophy winner, George Rogers, the first selection does belong, of course, to the New Orleans Saints. Rogers, 5,200 yards on his career rushing, and also a good receiver as well. A lot of people say that Bum should take some linebacker help. His son, his son, the defensive coordinator, Wade, says that. But I think with the two picks they have on the second round, with the first choice, of course, again on the second round, they'll probably go for their defensive help there. Of course, is his wrist okay? He had the slight wrist problem late in his senior year. If his wrist is healed, he could be ready to step right in and move a ball club into uh, possibly contender status. The Giants own the second selection. It's thought they will go for defensive end Lawrence Taylor out of North Carolina, number 98 projected as a linebacker like bud said where these players are selected is going to indicate how much money they're going to get and there's some talk that some giants players might walk out if he gets the seven hundred fifty thousand dollars for three years he's asking but he's an excellent player and he's moved up to the top of the linebacker class right now the jets own pick number three overall in the draft the third pick in the first round they are thought to be leaning towards freeman mcneil number 24 the running back out of ucla the Jets fans in the balcony in New York are probably going to scream again when a defensive player is not taken. But again, the draft is 12 rounds. You can get that help later on. And McNeil will help them because of his versatility coming out of the backfield to catch the ball. He's a good blocker and, of course, a good runner, as we can see. Well, those are, are the projections for the first three picks. They are, of course, subject to change, the trades and uh, machinations that will occur at the uh, Sheridan. Also, we'll be checking in live at Manucci's and also live in Oakland, California, seeing exactly what's happening out west. 
And we'll check back in in just a moment with New York as ESPN's live and continuous coverage of the National Football League draft continues. Welcome back to New York City, the New York Sheridan Hotel. We're ready for eight and one half hours of action. As Bob Lee and company told us at the broadcast center, there are a lot of prospective things that may be happening during the course of the next hour or so during the top of the round drafting. And to comment on those, Paul Zimmerman of Sports Illustrated will be with us to add his expert commentary during the course of the draft. And of course, our own Sal Marciano will be acting as more or less a center fielder to keep us all on top of what's happening and add his expert commentary as well. Now, when we talk about what's happening during the course of this draft, all day long, Greg Gumbel will be part of our commentary, and he'll be filling us in on how a lot of the teams have done in recent memory as far as the draft is concerned. The Saints have draft pick number one. Greg Gumbel takes a look at the New Orleans Saints history. The New Orleans Saints have been the worst team around for quite some time now. Too long, in fact, if you happen to be a New Orleans fan. And the reason is downright incompetence when it comes to draft time. The statistics will tell the story for New Orleans. Only nine starters through the draft over the last six years. In 1976 and again in 78, the Saints had the number three overall pick. Over the last six years, the Saints had seven first-round choices, only three of them with the team today. Wide receiver Wes Chandler, kicker Russell Erksleben, and last year's number one choice, Dan Brock. Six of the starters for the Saints came as free agents. Premium errors, the Saints haven't made them recently, but they do have some in their history. Bob Watts in 77, Bob Simmons in 76, and four of them in 1975. But the Saints need a good, solid, productive draft this time around. Bum Phillips, the new head coach of the Saints, has quite a challenge ahead of him. You see, the Saints have been in the NFL for 14 years, and they haven't had a winning season yet. Thanks, Greg. Greg will be filling us in on each one of the teams as we come to draft time, as we feel it's necessary. Paul Zimmerman, uh, you had your mock draft. You felt, as of last night, that probably the Saints would go for George Rogers. How does it shape up this morning? Well, uh, if you remember, I said that if they made a trade, it would be for veterans, not for drafts. They have 18 picks. I don't think they need more choices. They don't need numbers. Uh, they need good players, uh, proven players. Uh, I don't know uh, how much sense it would make to trade Rodgers uh, or whoever they want to draft. I know the Cowboys are after him, and they've offered uh, Di Brown, Larry Bethea, and Ron Springs, which means they want to get rid of their mistakes. Um, except for Springs, he was proven. But the others are just players that, that they want to get rid of. Uh, if you remember, uh, the Cowboys traded three times to get uh, either the top pick in the whole draft or close to it. They got Tony Dorsett, Tupal Jones, and Randy White, who were very near the top, and that's the heart of their team. And uh, the people they gave up were Craig Morton, Cody Smith, uh, Billy Parkinson draft. All right, that's part of the story. The draft picture, as far as the fans are concerned, is another part of the story. Leandra Riley is ready as we begin the fans' entrance here at the Sheridan Hotel in New York City. Well, as you can see, there is quite a crowd here at the Sheraton, and the fans have been lining up. Are you ready for this? Since quarter to five this morning. The fans are ready to pass out cards and numbers and things like that so that it's an organized entry to the draft. And if you think it's difficult being a player, a collegiate player, to be drafted, it's even more difficult these days to be a fan. Not only do they have to get up at the sunrise to get a good seat in the house today, but they also are involved in a fan contest. And with me is a young man from, uh, from Wilmington, Vermont. Your name, please, and the team that you're rooting for. Dave Thomas, a diehard Jets fan. Okay, now Dave Thomas got here at quarter to five in the morning, and how many drafts have you been to? This will be my ninth draft, and the ninth draft where I've been one of the first five in the draft itself. Okay, and he's, of course, referring to being the first five fans. You were involved with the contest last year, and for those of you that are unfamiliar with it, the NFL sponsors a contest in which the fans are invited to select the first 28 choices. If there is a tie, it will then go into selection for accuracy in terms of players chosen for teams but uh how did you do last year last year was one of my best years i had 19 out of the first 21 picks pinpointed i had 23 picks all together what killed me the end was the defensive backs being picked i guess all the teams were scared after the jets went for lamb jones okay as you can see the fans are knowledgeable the competition is stiff so let's go back with more nfl draft action 
Thanks, Leandra, and she'll be filling us in on what's happening in the gallery all day long for eight and one half hours. Sal Marciano, draft number one goes to the Saints. How do you see it at this point? Well, the Saints are sitting on that top pick, and everybody's still wondering if even at this last moment are they going to trade it away. There's a competition of another sort, and that's between administrators, executives, and evaluators of talent. Uh, Dick Steinberg and uh, Steve Rosenblum, of course, resigned from New Orleans when John Macon made his decision to go with uh, Bum Phillips. And Steinberg left New Orleans with a shot at the organization by saying if he was still in New Orleans, he would take uh, Lawrence Taylor, the linebacker from South Carolina, as opposed to George Rogers. To me, that's he's leaving town and, and throwing a rock at, at uh, the organization. And I wonder at this moment, uh, you know, we all do, if Bum Phillips is going to sit on it and choose Rogers, despite what Steinberg said, or is he going to trade it away? That is pick number one. It will be coming up in just about 15 minutes or so, the first pick of this 1981 National Football League draft. The man who will preside over that first pick is with our Sam Rosen on the floor here in the Grand Ballroom at the Sheridan. Sam? And, George, the commissioner almost didn't make it. He got stuck in the elevator coming downstairs. He spent about 20 minutes with some of your people. Uh, they finally got us out. Commissioner, uh, a lot of work goes into the NFL draft, and uh, the teams do a lot of homework, a lot of preparation. I wonder if you could talk about the intricacies of the preparation for this draft. Well, of course, they start following them uh, in their freshman year, and uh, they just compile every bit of information they can because the draft is the really the lifeblood of the development of the football team, and they don't like to make mistakes. And uh, today, of course, is the culmination of having watched these players for four years. What do you think is going to happen early in this first round? I imagine it'll be a surprise or two. They're usually, uh, that usually happens, either a sudden trade or uh, a switch in someone's anticipated position, them taking someone that wasn't expected. Had a couple of uh, developments happen last evening. Vince Ferragamo and James Scott signing with Montreal in the uh, Canadian Football League. What's your reaction to those uh, players signing with the CFL? Well, sorry to see them not stay in the National Football League. We'll just have to uh, go out and find others like them, I guess, the clubs will in the draft. Do you think that moves like that will affect how the team will draft? It will could. That's right. It will could for, for both teams, for both the Rams and the Bears. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you for being with us. Now back to George Graham. Thanks, Sam. Uh, Sam will be on the floor during the course of this entire eight-and-a-half-hour broadcast to get a reaction from some of the team officials, from some of the media people who will be here, some of the players as well. Chris Berman is at Mike Minucci's. We'll check in with him after this word. Zimmerman and Sal Marciano will be adding commentary. Sam Rosen is on the floor of the ballroom at the Sheridan to give us the perspective of the different team officials. Leandra Riley is with the fans here at the Sheridan. And at one of the favorite sports watering holes of New York City, apropos, Chris Berman is there at Mike Minucci's. Chris, how are things looking over there? Thank you very much, George. And you can see the, uh, the red and the white tablecloth may be a little early for some to start going, but we're at Mike Minucci's restaurant where a lot of sports folk and the Big Apple will be coming out to give their opinions on the draft. It's at 7th Avenue and 52nd. If you're in the Big Apple, you want to give your opinion, by all means, stop by. Frank Ross is with me from Inside Sports, along with Jack Goff, the first commissioner of the ABA. And Frank, before the bar opens, uh, what do you <laughs> expect to see here in the draft, uh, the first few picks? Well, it's ironic that the first 14 selection today are the only clubs that did not make the playoffs in the last decade. Uh, for the Giants, if the Saints make a change and go with Lawrence Taylor, George Young will be confronted with the opportunity to decide between Hugh Green and George Rogers. He'll take Rogers. For the Jets, if they take Freeman McNeil, I think that'll be a mistake, primarily because McNeil uh, will help their running game, but two years ago they led the league in rushing, but they only won eight games. Yeah. Hugh Green could help their defense much in the manner that Buddy Curry did with uh, Atlanta last year. Well, hopefully the, the next decade will be better drafting for those uh, four teams. Jack. The draft, it's, a, it's an interesting setup in, in sports, isn't it? Well, it's an interesting setup in, in all of business, Chris. It's, uh, it's unique uh, to the American uh, uh, industrial system, and it's a, it's a way, a very logical and, and brilliant way to keep uh, uh, equal uh, competition in the league. I've been all for it since uh, I worked with the ABA, and I think it's a magnificent system. But I uh, take exception to what uh, you guys say about the draft. You can't uh, fault the Jets with uh, Chris Ward and Lamb Jones, uh, Lam, uh, Jones and the rest of them 
I think they've had a terrific history. Yeah, well, they have a terrific history, but now they have the chance to do a little bit more uh, defensive thinking. That's what I would like to see the Jets do. Uh, if I were a Jet fan, I'd agree. All right, let's go back to draft headquarters at the Sheraton. Thank you very much, gentlemen. And as I mentioned, the draft has had a very long and storied history starting in 1936 up to today as we begin the 46th edition of the Player Selection, the National Football League Collegiate Player Draft. Back at our broadcast center, Bob Lee has also prepared another look at this 1981 National Football League Draft. Bob? Thank you very much, George. So much preparation goes into this draft, the scouting, the computers, the money, and the time, and the people that's involved. But there's one team that belongs to no scouting combine in the National Football League. They also happen to own the current Super Bowl a trophy. They are the Oakland Raiders. Ron Barr is standing by now in Oakland, California, to give us an idea how the world champs approach this draft. From here, we'll be telling you what the National Football League's Western teams do. Down at San Diego, they'll probably go defensive in the first round as Don Coriel tries to get some cornerbacks. He has an aging offensive line, but still the emphasis probably will be defensive with uh, Jack Pardee as new defensive coordinator. The same probably will be true up in Seattle with Jack Patera as Jack Patera tries to bolster his defense, but he'd also like to try to put some output in his offense, so he may go for Freeman McNeil in the first round. The same thing at Denver as Dan Reeves, the new coach there, tries to revitalize that Bronco offense. He, too, would like to have Freeman McNeil. Across the bay at San Francisco, Bill Walsh wants cornerbacks or anybody in the defensive backfield, so Kenny Easley or Ronnie Lott may be the pick there. Here at the Raider headquarters, they are coming off a world championship season, so their pick will be something of a stockpiling nature. And we have with us Al Ocasal, executive assistant to Al Davis. Al, how are you all approaching this draft? Well, not much differently than usual. You know, we've won our world championship for the second time in five years. We did it with great veteran talent, and we feel that's how we'll do it in the future. What we're looking for in the draft are people three years down the road, actually. The 81 season is where they'll come in here and learn the system, begin to develop the motivation, traditions of the Raiders. In 1982, they'll be playing some special uh, situation substitution, and in 1983, for the most part, pushing their way up. We've only had seven rookies start here since 1967. We win with veteran people, but we win. Thanks a lot, Al. So the Raiders will be going uh, with the team they have, but trying to stockpile some quality players. They'll be picking 21st and 28th in that first round. From the Raider headquarters, I'm Ron Barr. Thank you, Ron. They are the only team, the Raiders, with two first round selections this year. Let's go back now to the Sheraton and our own George Graham. George? Thank you very much, Bob. The way things are developing here, we are waiting for pick number one. The New Orleans Saints will have that first selection. And the rumors that we have, uh, the Oakland rumors, the New Orleans rumors, we understand in uh, talking to people during the course of the last uh, couple of days, and there you see the Saints table as we're developing uh, uh, the last minute preparations uh, at the New Orleans table. Uh, Dan Simmons there, you see uh, shuffling the papers as they're getting ready to pick on uh, uh, pick number one. Paul, what do you think is going to happen as far as uh, the trade possibilities are concerned? It's a domino effect. If one moves, then there may be two or three in the, the next four or five picks. Well, it sure dominoes my picks in the magazine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think New Orleans is going to pick Rodgers. Uh, I talked to John Meekham the night before last, and he was complaining about the price. He gave me something like a $5 million package that Jack Mills was asking. Jack Mills is Roger's agent. He was Meekham's fraternity brother in college. And Meekham says that Jack Mills is just an errand boy, and Jim Carlin, the South Carolina coach, is calling the shot. They're crying poverty. They're saying the price is too big. Uh, and if, if they don't take him, that's why. But, you know, this is all draft talk. Uh, it doesn't mean anything yet. How about the Rams? The Ferragamo uh, defection yesterday became official. What possibilities are there there? I don't think they'll pick Campbell in the first round. I think if they upgrade, you now I projected a uh, trade with the Jets to get up to uh, the third pick. I think they'll, they'll take the super running back, uh, McNeil, and try and go with Hayden. Klosterman keeps saying how great Hayden is. All right, well, we'll see as it develops during the course of now the next 10 minutes. They'll be making that first pick in about seven or eight minutes. Let's check back up in the gallery with Leandro Riley. Leandro. We're up here with some of the fans, and uh, right now there's a young man here who happens to be a Jet fan. His name is Evan Glass. I don't know if you can see Evan in the darkness here, but Evan, you said you said that the scouts, and let's let's move a little bit more into our lighting here. Evan, yeah. you, you weren't particularly happy with the scouting situation. How do you feel about the way the scouts set up their uh, ratings? Well, uh, the scouts 
if judges the players ba mainly on the All Star game, and if a player plays poorly in the All Star game, he doesn't he doesn't count it as a detriment to him. Whereas if he plays well, you know, it just he just adds points onto the system. So as where Lomax has played poorly in the All Star game, it was his first real competition. He still he still played poorly, and they gave well they ex they accepted that he played well, so it's, it, it counted as a benefit to him. But in reality, uh, for another ball player, like for Herman, it would have been a detriment for him. Um, do you think that there should be a detrimental type system? In other words, it shouldn't be all positive? Yeah, yeah, because if he plays poorly against, like, Lomax was finally playing against players of his equal of his equal caliber. So for this is the first time that he plays against players of his equal, and he doesn't play well, and it doesn't count as a strike against him, it seems to me to be uh, ridiculous. Okay, that's how the fans feel about the scouting situation. Let's go back to George Grant and see if we're ready for our first pick. Thanks, Leandra. We are approaching pick number one. You remember when we moved to the first couple of picks of last year, there was excitement, and a lot of the fans of the gallery got involved in it because it involved the Jets. They traded uh, between 13 and 20 in order to get their pick uh, for, from San Francisco to try to get that first-round pick, and they wound up taking Lamb Jones. We'll see if that kind of suspense is upcoming. We'll be back with more of the 1981 ESPN coverage of the National Football League draft in just a minute. But first, let's go back to Bob Lee at our broadcast center. Thank you very much, George. We were talking to Big Vermeil on Sunday special, and he said, Bud, that the firm policy, for example, of the Eagles, never to trade a one, two, or three uh, first, second, or third round draft pick. What uh, is the feeling of having coached in the pros? Do different clubs, uh, is there that much of a variance on policies? Obviously, we're looking towards the first round when, when L.A. may want to make a move up, to maybe even to Seattle's position for us. But what's, what's your feeling on that? Well, it, it relates really to the coaching situation related to management in the future. There's an old saying among coaches that you can build a winner in three or four years. Unfortunately, you will not be there to coach them. <laughs> so yeah. basically, uh, if you're insecure, uh, in any long-term tenure, uh, you might be willing to trade for proven ability. That really relates to the Packers, too, where Bart Starr is no longer GM. He has only one year remaining on the contract. The feeling is he may go for the immediate need and not look at the long-term need, for example, of a quarterback. He may go for his defensive backfield this year. Uh, I would recommend that. <laughs> Howard, uh, as you have documented so well in the sporting news, as we have a variety of picks owned by other teams. Some of these trades are bizarre at best when you think of, for example, some of the George Allen moves that have been made. He simply needed a, a pick several years ago, and he traded away. He gave away the farm. 1977, it was the seventh round of the draft, and George wanted a tight end. So he made a deal with the Rams, got the Rams pick in the seventh round that year, and their ninth. He drafted Reggie Haynes and Mike Northington, and for those extra two picks, George gave the Rams his third round pick this year. And of course, George is not there anymore, and the Redskins don't have a pick in the third round. And what they ended up doing is trading a number three for a seven and a nine. <laughs> so <laughs> that, that's, that's a kind of trade that certainly didn't work out. A lot of the trades, of course, were hearing about and having speculate on the first round are switches in position. I've heard that St. Louis and San Francisco might be talking because the 49ers want Kenny Easley and they're afraid he might be gone. We've heard, of course, the talk with the Rams and the Jets. So it's going to be interesting to see where trades happen, but I, there might not be as much as there's been in the past because the teams, again, are holding mm -hmm. on to their picks because it is a deep draft. Paul, you know the Bills so well. They did so well last year. They're way down in the draft. They have definite defensive needs. Do you think maybe they might be going quickly? Well, you know, the, the Buffalo Bills need one thing. They need a fullback, Bob, so badly. And uh, I wouldn't be surprised to see them to try to trade up. Okay. You're watching exclusive live coverage of the National Football League Draft, the 1981 College Selection, live right here on ESPN. There you see the gallery as the suspense builds during the course of probably the next minute and a half to two minutes. Pick number one will be made of this National Football League collegiate player draft. There is Commissioner Pete Rozelle. To his right is Dan Van Duzer. To his left, Val Pinchback, the director of broadcasting. Van Duzer, the director of this draft. Uh, and as you might imagine, uh, the talk at this moment centers on the New Orleans table. Will they make a trade? Will they pick George Rogers? Or will they go with Lawrence Taylor? We should tell you that the uh, commissioner indicated to us just a couple of moments ago, at this point, there is no indication that any trades have been made at this point. But again, remember, we should reiterate, this is a domino effect. If one pick is made, then there is a possibility of maybe one or two trades that are contingent on that pick possibly coming to fruition. So we won't know until the wheels go into motion. And those wheels are just now beginning to turn. 
Commissioner Roselle within moments is set to make kick number one. And we will go from now through till 6 o'clock Eastern, 3 o'clock Pacific with all the latest. Paul? Well, I hope there's no trade. Uh, I projected Rogers. One interesting thing is I don't see Rogers in the room. Usually uh, they have the first player here. Uh, and uh, I, I don't see him around, which makes me a little nervous. Okay, here's Commissioner Pete Roselle. He is ready to make the first selection. That's Commissioner Roselle, ready at the podium now to make uh, the first selection of draft number one. Joe Ryan of the NFL offices beginning to come over. He's got to turn the microphone on before the, you can hear the commissioner. <laughs> so <laughs> while there are multi-million dollar operations waiting, they have to wait for a 15-cent mic switch. The 46th annual National Football League selection meeting is now in session. First choice, first round, belongs to the New Orleans Saints. Saints first up. There's the card which will hold with it the first pick of this 1981 draft. Each team has 15 minutes to make the selection. New Orleans Saints take as the first player the 46th annual draft. Running back George Rogers of South Carolina. Giants. The clock will recycle, and coming in right in front of us is George Rogers. You'll be seeing him momentarily onto your screen. The running back, the Heisman Trophy winner from South Carolina, George the Rogers. Giants, Stand by. First round selection, Lawrence Taylor, linebacker, North Carolina. There you have pick number one and pick number two, and here you have George Rogers coming to the podium. The first player selected in the draft, George Rogers. sure going to be getting my best, and, and that's 100% every time I go out on the field. And I'd like to thank everybody here for, for you know, for, for the, for the hos hospitality that they gave me so far. In New Orleans, I'm coming. There you have George Rogers, the first pick of this 1981 draft, the man who scored 186 points, rushed for 31 touchdowns, 22 straight games, over 100 yards. He is the number one pick in draft. 1981 here from New York, the number two pick, Lawrence Taylor. So, so far, Paul Zimmerman, things have gone as expected. Yeah, but I think I'm headed for a downer because I had uh, L.A. trading to the Jets first pick for McNeil. I think McNeil will be the pick, but it looks like the trade hasn't been made. Val Marciano? Everything is going along smoothly except for Commissioner Roselle. He was stuck in an elevator about a half hour ago. Then his PA system didn't work. It took uh, the Saints and then the Giants only a matter of seconds to make their choices. And uh, we have uh, George, Rogers will be available George Rogers still on the podium with Commissioner Roselle posing for pictures. The Jets are next, and uh, as everybody keeps saying, the trades didn't come. You know, uh, we suspicion that Al Davis got to that elevator. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Paul, we had two picks. Paul, pick number three, let's go to the commission. The New York Jets. First round selection, UCLA running back, Freeman McNeil. The Jets did what was rumored for the last couple of days. They go with McNeil. There will be no Rams trade up, at least at the number three position. The first round, the Seattle Seahawks. Okay, the rumors on Seattle, Hugh Green uh, has been someone that uh, Jack Patera has coveted. Uh, of course, uh, uh, last year they took another Green, Jacob Green, who's a great defensive end. Patera himself was a great linebacker. Uh, some indications are that maybe they would go with Green and make him into a linebacker. 
Rodgers has gone number one to the Saints. Number two, Lawrence Taylor, the linebacker, uh, to the Giants. Number three, Freeman McNeil to the Jets. You heard the crowd reaction upstairs. Leandro Riley is upstairs. Of course, you know that this is a Giants jet packed house because the draft is held in New York City. Leandro, what's the reaction? Well, the reaction up here has been that they wanted Hugh Green chosen, but with me is John Capolitano. John, who are you a fan of? Nobody. I absolutely have no professional team that's a favorite of mine whatsoever. Why are you at the draft then? Because I am a college football fan, and I study it, and I do this, do this every year, and I try to see how well I do against the professional scouts. All right, then after the players graduate, they're selected in the draft, what happens to your interest in football? Well, I try to follow some of the players, you know, to see how well they do do, but not on a, I don't go crazy like this. Okay, let's go back to the floor. New York Jets first round choice, Freeman McNeil, running back, UCLA. There you have it, the commissioner just reaffirming that pick by the Jets. Some Jets fans wishing that they could have taken it back and made another one. That tells you something about the Jets, Al, because uh, at the end of the season, Clark Gaines uh, limped through a mini drill a little while ago, a couple of weeks ago. He's not 100%. Harper, there are indications that he is not 100%. So they went with the one thing they thought they needed offensively, some speed outside. McNeil, some people have regarded as even possibly a better potential running back than George Rogers. Bill, it must have been an agonizing decision for Walt Michaels and his staff to make because of uh, the obvious uh, deficiencies on defense in the Jets. And Walt, of course, is a defensive-oriented uh, coach. And yet his defensive teams have been awful. Last year, uh, the Jets ranked 21st among the 28 teams in yardage allowed and 25th amongst the 28 teams in points allowed. Now, obviously, porous. They obviously need help on defense, but they had to get a running back to complement the passing game. And for Walt Michaels in his fifth year, a very big decision, perhaps the biggest decision of his coaching career. Also, we should tell you that Joe Gardy is the new defensive coordinator for the Jets. He is uh, regarded as uh, strong in Michaels' organization as well. So there is a feeling that they wanted defense, but they end up going for McNeil. Over at Mike Minucci's, Chris Berman is there, and Chris was just with Hickey and company a couple of days ago. How do you read this one, Chris? Still here with Frank Ross and Jack Dolphin. I want to make a correction that Jack is the second commissioner of the ABA, not the first. George Mikan was a little bit bigger. I'll tell you, the frowns on some people's faces here in Minucci's for the offensive pick of the Jets are all around. So let me ask you this, Jack. Everything has gone pretty much as planned right away. That doesn't happen most of the time with first and second. Oh, it, happened, it happens uh, quite uh, seldom because uh, if New Orleans had gone with somebody else, it changes everybody's plans. This is like as professional as like working on the stock exchange floor. <laughs> you know, you, can't, you don't know what to expect. It's one of the most exciting moments in American sports. And then all of a sudden, all the teams use their time clocks. Great. Yeah. That'll, ha that'll happen before the day's over. All right. Well, let's go back right now to the draft center at the Sheridan. Thank you very much, Chris. We are standing by for pick number four, which will be the Seattle Seahawks. Indications have been that possibly if Hugh Green was available, they would go with Green. We will see shortly if that is the case. Each team in the first two rounds gets 15 minutes between selections. Following that, it is five minutes per selection. With a fellow who is no stranger to the story of the draft because he's a broadcaster as well as an all-pro punter. Sam Rosen is here with Dave Jennings of the Giants. Sam. Thank you, George. And Dave Jennings, the New York Giants, number two pick in the draft overall. Go for a linebacker, Lawrence Taylor. What are your thoughts about that pick? Well, there's really no surprise there. It's been written for, um, you know, so many weeks. That's the guy we were after. Uh, you know, I thought something might happen with that first pick with New Orleans. Maybe a little trade, because I know Dallas is interested and maybe a few other teams. But really no surprises. And from what I understand, the coaches I've talked with and the scouts, Taylor, he could be the best football player, pure football player in the draft. So it's got to help us. And, you know, I I'm get a pick like that it's just really thrilling now he's a, a talented player but the Giants seem to be deep in linebackers and uh, it's a team that didn't score all that many points last season there was a lot of talk why not go for offense well that's true but if you remember in our last game against Oakland we didn't have any of our linebackers who start for us weren't even playing in the game so we had a lot of injuries last year and uh, he is really going to help us offensively I guess they feel the Giants feel we can get a good running back or a tight end on the second and third rounds and that's what we're going to look forward to in the, you know, in the next hour or two there was there was some controversy uh, earlier this week that uh, some of the linebackers some of the defensive players might walk out well I uh, think that's just talk and I, I really believe if they decided to walk coach Perkins would open the door for them and give them plain fare wherever they're going uh, I think it was just talk and I don't really think there was a lot to the to the talk thank you Dave Jennings 
Sam, let me ask you one question before Dave gets away. Yes, how about George. his contract? He's been going back and forth for uh, the last uh, year on a possible contract. What about your contract? They're talking about uh, your contract with the Giants. Is things all settled with you? All settled as of a couple of months ago, and I'm looking forward to about 20 more years with the Giants. Okay, and he just bought a house in Upper Saddle River, New Jersey, closer to Giants Stadium. So he'll be close to the Giants, uh, within punting distance of Giants Stadium. With the wind in my back, yes. <laughs> back to you, George. Thanks, Sam. Bill Parcells, the new defensive coordinator of the Giants. So the indications are they're going to that 3-4 defense. They want the linebackers. Mayfield Taylor can go inside or outside in that 3-4 setup. A significant pick by the Giants. Lawrence Hill, the great linebacker, regarded as the premier linebacker. They uh, put him on a par with Hugh Green. The only difference is he's about 20 pounds heavier and a little bit bigger. That's why Taylor went before Hugh Green. We'll be back with more of ESPN's coverage of the 1981 National Football League Collegiate Draft after you have time to take a sip of water, too. Here's the stop. The ball is down. Dempsey kicks. It's on the way. Tom Dempsey kicked the longest field goal in NFL history, 63 yards. Red Grange ran his way into the pages of NFL history with men like Jim Thorpe, Bronco Nagurski, and Sammy Ball. They are all here, the records, the men, the glory, and the memories. And you can see and hear them at the NFL Hall of Fame in Canton, Ohio. Don't miss it. We're waiting for Seattle to make their selection. The Seahawks have approximately six minutes left. Each team with 15 minutes on the first round. We had our first three selections in four minutes. George Rogers to New Orleans, Lawrence Taylor to the Jets, Freeman McNeil to, or rather, Taylor to the Giants, and McNeil to the Jets. Congratulations, Howard Balsey. You had it bullseye right on the nose. Who is this here? I don't know if I should quit while I'm ahead or not. Who do you quickly <laughs> see as the uh, Seahawks' next selection? Well, I projected them taking Hugh Green. And the Seahawks have always been a team that's surprised, and they're taking a lot of time, but it'll be hard for them to pass up Hugh Green. And then the Cardinals, I think, should grab linebacker E.J. Jr. from Alabama, but the Cardinals so often in the past haven't done what everyone expects them to do. Bud, we heard some of the reaction, uh, as perhaps could be expected about the Jets' selection. They have the defensive needs. They go for McNeil. But uh, let's just a quick thought on exactly that selection, the offensive move. Well, if your offense is good enough, then you've got the ball the majority of the time. If you don't move it offensively, then you're on the field playing defense, and you don't win if you're on the field playing defense very often. Of course, those <coughs> selections, Paul, that were made so quickly in the first uh, four minutes, now it really gets down to nuts and bolts time whether someone's going to make a move because you need those 15 minutes not to let people quit but to work behind the scenes. Yeah, I think the interesting thing is going to happen when you get down towards Tampa Bay and, and San Francisco. They both need defensive backs, and... Uh, I wouldn't be surprised to see either one of those two teams make a trade with possibly New England for a defensive back. Okay, Seattle has made their selection. It is Kenny Easley. Let's go back now to New York. Thank you, Bob. We're back here at the Sheridan. Just a couple of seconds ago, the commissioner stepped up and announced that the Seattle Seahawks picking fourth in the National Football League 81 draft. They're taking Ken Easley, the defensive back from the University of California at Los Angeles. Next up, the St. Louis Cardinals. As you might imagine, uh, Paul Zimmerman, uh, defensive backs are a premium in this draft. What do you think St. Louis will go to? Ronnie Rod or uh, Hugh Green, but um, depends on how, how much they want Campbell. Uh, when I talked to him, he said they want a defense first, Rod or Green. But uh, don't be surprised if Campbell comes to that. St. Louis Cardinals, 5-11 and 11 last year. They've had six coaches during the course of the last 11 years. That tells you something about their draft history as well. Greg Gumbel has a wrap-up on it for us from our broadcast center as we look at the Cardinals' history of the NFL draft. Cardinals have had some fairly good drafts recently. The trouble is they don't make up for the bad St. Louis draft history, which dates all the way back to 1970. From 1970 through 1978, the St. Louis Cardinals had 29 first, second, or third round picks, and of those 29 picks, only four made any headway at all in a St. Louis uniform. That's a lot of premium errors. Take a look at the chart, and it will tell you the story. It shows 10 draftees in the St. Louis starting lineup, three more through free agency, one on waivers, and two through the trade route. One premium error last year, and then another in 78, three in 77, one in 76, two in 75. The Cardinals draft history, not good at all, and that has to change if the St. Louis fortunes are to do likewise. What is needed in St. Louis is another draft, like the one in 1979, which produced the likes of Otis Anderson and Joe Bostic, and not like the one in 77, which produced 
Steve Pazakowicz from George Franklin. Thanks, Greg. Here we are back at the ball, and there you see the St. Louis Cardinals table. Uh, Gordon Beatty and Rube Panic set to make the selection that comes from General Manager Joe Sullivan, George Boone, and Larry Wilson, who are back in St. Louis. This is a phone hookup situation. Uh, most of the top draft people are at the home sites of these individual teams. They have representatives here. They can either be assistant coaches, equipment men, uh, people that are part of the general manager's office. As you might imagine, uh, at this point in time, uh, the discussions are many fold because the Los Angeles Rams still have the potential for trading up because still if they, obviously if they want a McNeil, he is gone now, but there still is a potential with Ferragamo gone that they can go for a quarterback. Up in the gallery, Leandro Riley. Leandro, how does it look up there? It looks pretty good. There were quite a few surprise football fans up here that Hugh Green wasn't selected, and Don Malmokavich of New Jersey is one of those fans. What do you think St. Louis should do now? I think St. Louis would go with Ronnie Locke. Uh, he's he's a defensive back, and they have a defensive backfield that's getting old. I guess Roger Worley has played a number of years, and last year when they played the Giants, uh, he had a lot of trouble. As a matter of fact, I think they substituted uh, for Roger Worley last year. So you don't think they should go with Hugh Green? Well, I, I don't know. I, I think I think they need help in their uh, uh, defensive secondary. However, they obviously know their team a little bit better than I do. How are you doing so far in your uh, selection? Uh, right now I've picked uh, three out of four. Not bad, 75%. Let's go back to George Grant and see what's happening on the floor. All right, we're waiting at just a little over 10 minutes remaining on the next selection, the St. Louis Cardinals selection. Sal, so far, Paul Zimmerman's been pretty hot. He picked the first three athletes off the top. He picked Green to go for Seattle and said it was easy, but he was right on defense. And so far, South Carolina and UCLA have a lock on this uh, draft so far. The first two players, the South Carolina players, and the next two UCLA players. The, the pick of Ken Easley by uh, Seattle, uh, do you think, uh, uh, Paul, do you believe that uh, that Easley was picked because he, he he can return kicks instead of lot? Oh, possibly. Uh, I think they must have had a, a very uh, interesting high-level discussion over the last few days. Uh, the first guy that they wanted was Green. Then they wanted a running back. Uh, then their third need was defensive back. And Lott and Easley were running neck and neck. And, and usually when those things come down to the wire in the wee hours of the morning, it's whoever uh, argues the best and the longest that can outlast the other. And somebody must have been an easy, easy spot. We should indicate, too, that from the standpoint of this draft, Kenny Easley, Ronnie Lott, uh, Smith also from uh, uh, the University of Southern California, Dennis Smith, and also Dixon. Andrew Dixon uh, regarded as a prime candidate for the top spot from a defensive standpoint. You have to imagine that when you look at uh, what's happening uh, this year from a defensive backfield standpoint, uh, most of the athletes that they look at, they're going to want to move to a cornerback position one way or another. Uh, Easley, there is a question whether or not he can be switched or where he will play from a defensive standpoint. If there is a criticism, it was that he might uh, freelance too much at UCLA. Well, usually uh, what happens is you draft a cornerback and then you move into safety. Very uh, seldom do you draft a safety and move into cornerback. Lot was able to make that switch, so I, I think Easley's a pure safety. Yeah, I want to correct myself. It's Lawrence Taylor of North Carolina, not South Carolina. We're still waiting on the St. Louis pick. We have just a little over nine minutes remaining till the St. Louis time expires. We're standing by to see if a trade does come to fruition. We'll be back with more of the 1981 National Football League draft exclusively on ESPN after this week. There's the scene set, seven minutes and counting for the St. Louis Cardinals first round pick. If you are just joining us, the Saints have taken George Rogers, you expected that. The Giants have taken Lawrence Taylor, you expected that. The Jets did not trade their pick. They picked Freeman McNeil of the University of California at Los Angeles. And Seattle picked Kenny Easley. There you see the fans upstairs in the gallery. Uh, the setting here at the Grand Ballroom at the Sheridan as you can see, there is a lower level and an upper level. Quite simply, this used to be a pool. There used to be a swimming pool here at the Sheridan. Uh, they took the pool away, and as you can see, you end up with a gallery, which used to be uh, the top part right around the swimming pool. And down below, the National Football League teams have set up their 28 tables from each and every team in phone communication with their offices back in their original areas. Uh, what a way it's changed. Uh, back in the 60s and 50s, it used to be done on a blackboard, uh, and it was uh, more or less a shoestring operation. Um, when the merger came, it became a big league operation, as has everything in professional football these days. So, 
We are waiting on the St. Louis Cardinals as the clock continues to run down after the St. Louis Cardinals pick, and we've already heard Paul Zimmerman indicate what the prospective uh, uh, pick may go towards come the Green Bay Packers. There are discussions that the Packers may go for the first quarterback in this draft, but they also need help in the line. If they're going to go for the quarterback, then there's some people that I'm never going to talk to again because they lied. Uh, they said uh, Ronnie Rock was their first preference and Keith Van Horn, the tackle from SU, was their second. They said they worked Campbell out and uh, they're worried about his mobility. They said he didn't run sideways for us. Paul, let me ask you. Uh, around the league, if you talk to the players, you talk to the coaches, you're regarded uh, as uh, one of the foremost writers and people that cover the league because you do your homework. You talk to people. You uh, you get the, the straight story from them. How much of a chess game is this? You talk to the player personnel people. Now, what do you do afterwards? You add up what they told you, uh, uh, see if it pans out, and see uh, uh, how they, whether or not they were straight with you? Every year, I weed out the straight from the liars. I'll put an X next to the liar's name and never call him again. Last year, I got one. Can oh, I say who it is? That's all right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, at Mike Minucci's, Chris Berman is there to keep us abreast of what's happening with the Giant and Jet fans and some of the other uh, people, former players who will be there during the course of today. Let's go to Chris Berman and see what is transpiring uh, at Minucci's as we begin to wind down to the St. Louis Cardinals pick. We are under six minutes now as the Cardinals are prepared to make their first selection in this first round of the National Football League draft. Chris? Okay, George, Dave Scott and Mike Francesa are with me here from College and Pro Football News Weekly. And I guess uh, pretty much as according to plan, Dave. Yeah, no surprises, really. Uh, in fact, uh, the only thing I'm surprised at is that they didn't take their full uh, 15 minutes. It's refreshing if they've had four months to think about it and uh, they went right to it. Well, they pay for their 15 minutes. You would think they would use it. Yeah, well, now they've got other things to do. They can think about round two. It's a deep draft, and uh, there are a lot of good players. Mike, the, uh, the Seahawks going with, um, going with the defensive back, you thought maybe it would be Hugh Green. I know I did. I did because he's a defensive leader. I think he had a tremendous career at Pittsburgh. But I feel that that team needs a lot of help everywhere on defense. And another priority would be a tight end, and I feel they can get one, a good one on the second round. Do you think that Easley will go back to a, uh, uh, to a cornerback rather than a safety? I feel he has the talent to play any position in the defensive backfield. There's okay. probably safety. Yeah, all right, he can play anywhere. And there's still some rumblings with some New York fans over the picks. We'll get back to that in a little while. Now let's go back to the guys at the Sheridan. There you have it. We are winding down on the pick for the St. Louis Cardinals. As you can see it, it's 3 minutes and 41 seconds. It has to indicate at this point, Sal Marciano, that something is working. Uh, the Rams, we know, wanted to trade up. They traded from 20 down to 9 with the Redskins pick. They wanted to trade up possibly as high as the Jets pick. They weren't successful in doing that. They may try to be dealing at this point with St. Louis. Well, with uh, 3 minutes and 20-odd seconds left to go, this is a heck of a time to pull a trade. Uh, Paul, the Cardinals didn't have a bad trade uh, draft last year. What usually happens when you see it going down like this uh, is something has happened that they weren't expecting, like maybe the easily pick, and now they're trying to rush in that last-minute trade. Uh, they they under the wire. Three three I, I would say if L.A. is trying to make that trade, it would probably be for Campbell, but uh, I think he might be around when they when they draft, because now Hugh Green is available, that'll move it all down one, and I think maybe they can take a chance that if they want him. I, I don't think they do. Uh, it's, it's very complicated. If you're wondering what happens if St. Louis goes past the three-minute mark, they don't lose the pick. They just lose the moment of the pick. In other words, if they were to pass the three-minute mark and that card was not in the hands of the commissioner or one of the commissioner's representatives, then they would go down one more notch. So they would pick after Green Bay, whoever would make that pick. On the floor, Sam Rosen with more reaction. Thank you, George. I'm here with Hub Arkush, the publisher of Pro Football Weekly. And Hub, four picks have been made thus far. What do you think? Well, no real surprises. Possibly Kenny Easley going to Seattle, but they were looking for defensive help. They went to the secondary and set it on the line as well. What do you think's taking St. Louis so long? They're trying to decide between a quarterback they might have to wait a couple of years for, Campbell or Lomax, or going for maybe E.J. Jr., some help at linebacker. What do you think they need most? I would go for the linebacker. I don't think they can wait a couple of years right now. Later on, the Rams uh, have to be affected by uh, the defection of Vince Ferragamo to the CFL. They could be talking to St. Louis right now, trying to get that pick. Other than that, maybe talking to San Francisco. They're trying to get in position for Rich Campbell. That's what they're looking for now. Okay, what about the picks that have been made, and how do you feel they'll help? George Rogers, New Orleans Saints. Rogers should give immediate help. Any one of the first ten players chosen should step right in and play, and I think so far the first four players named all will. Thank you, Hub Arkush of uh, Pro Football Weekly. Let's go back to George Graham. 
There's your clock, a minute and 25 seconds as the St. Louis Cardinals and their table work to try to pull this deal off. Gordon Beatty and Rube Panic uh, trying to uh, keep in communication with the Brain Trust. Joe Sullivan, uh, the man who's been in charge of their uh, operations at one level or another since 1973. Uh, George Boone and Larry Wilson as well back in St. Louis trying to make this pick. If you're wondering why Hugh Green has gone this far, he was regarded as a can't miss prospect. Uh, the simple reason, there are basically two, I would think, Sal. First is that he played defensive end in college. He's going to play linebacker as a professional. The question is, how can he adjust to that? The second factor is his size. That's why Taylor went before him, because Taylor is bigger, uh, taller, and uh, weighs more. So that was one of the factors in the green situation to this point. We get down to such fine lines here. We're talking as if we're discussing thoroughbreds uh, getting ready for the Kentucky Derby. What's the difference between them? Obviously, it's all a matter of opinion. Let's go to Commissioner Roselle. Stand by. Here's the commissioner. You see the clock run down with 21 seconds. That's the St. Louis Cardinals table. The Packers follow the Cardinals. If they do not hit it within that clock time, the Packers will get six counts. the card has been handed to one of the commissioner's representatives. St. Louis Select. Okay. First round choice. E.J. Jr., linebacker, Alabama. E.J. Jr., Esther James Jr., the third. That card again, the card has to be handed in prior to that minute mark. Let's go back up to the gallery where Leandra has a St. Louis Cardinal fan. Leandra? With me is Walter Mack, who three months ago was in the hospital with open heart surgery, but you aren't going to miss this draft. Any surprises with E.J. Jr.? Uh, not too much. I figured he was going to go in the top one to five picks, you know? Okay, who was your first choice for St. Louis, though? Uh, I thought Lott would go. Well, Hugh Green. Are you, are you surprised that Hugh Green hasn't been drafted yet? Yes, I am, because he's a dynamite ball player. I thought he was going to be at least uh, number three in the whole draft. Okay, that's the St. Louis opinion. Thank you, Leandra. As it stands right now, the Green Bay Packers have just round up the clock, and they have approximately 13 and a half minutes to make their pick. So far, Rodgers has gone to the Saints, Lawrence Taylor to the Giants, Freeman McNeil to the Jets, Kenny Easley to Seattle, E.J. Jr. has gone to St. Louis. The Packers are up with their pick. We'll be back with more of ESPN's live and exclusive coverage of the National Football League player selection after this word. Bay selection, they have approximately 13 minutes to make their first round selection. Bud Wilkinson, uh, you know the cards very well. They go for a linebacker, E.J. Jr. I know it was as surprising here in the studio as it was in New York. Well, I think that uh, obviously they decided defense was their major need, whether to go with a defensive back or a linebacker. Uh, linebackers uh, are vitally important to stopping the opponent, but they don't beat you in one play like a defensive back does. I was a little bit surprised, though. Uh, I think that they feel they can get a quarterback uh, later in the draft. Jimmy Hart's been a great player, but Jimmy's getting to the end of his career. Well, some of the scouting reports, Paul, say that Junior is the best and was the best athlete on Alabama this past year, but uh, you don't share that opinion. You don't think he's in that same class as Green, do you? No, I don't. I saw uh, E.J. Junior play, or I did three other games last year, and I, I, I'm not that impressed with him. I don't think he is in the caliber of Hugh Green. I just think that Hugh Green, something is happening, and, and Howard, I know, has some opinions, yeah. but <laughs> something's happening going down the line, and I... I just can't believe that Hugh Green has not been taken ahead of E.J. Jr. Well, let's give Howard credit. He had the pick on, uh, dead on, but that was predicated on Green having been selected already. Is, is there a mob psychology now in effect that, that maybe there's something about Green that people are asking themselves? I think that happens a lot, Bob. It happened a couple of years ago with um, Kellen Winslow. A lot of people expected him to be taken very early. But as, certain, as each team passed on him, everyone else started thinking, well, maybe he's not the guy we think he is. And again, Junior was taken ahead of Green. He, he's bigger. He weighs more than Green. And so the teams now are thinking, well, maybe that, that team knows something that we don't know. And it sort of passes itself on down all through the round. And that might be what hap what's happening with Hugh Green. And now it's going to be interesting to see where Green does end up. we got Green Bay selecting now. I still think they'll go with Ronnie Lott. 
but Green might be a type of guy that might go to Tampa Bay then. It's going to be interesting to see what happens. Let's backtrack one pick back to Seattle, selecting defensive back Kenny Easley out of UCLA, a man who has played both safety and cornerback. Plays up well like a linebacker, but has the, the free safety instincts. You think that's a good selection for the Seahawks. Thank you, Paul. I really do. I had a chance to talk to uh, Chuck Allen, uh, who's the in charge of, of colleague scouting, and he said that they are a solid football team. And everybody, you know, that, of course, they did not win a game at home last year. Uh, but he said, we have our first 22 people are very solid. They needed a defensive back. They need a defensive end, and they would like to have a backup running back to go with Smith. So Seattle is sitting in, in a great position. They got one of the people that they really wanted, and that is Kenny Easley, and, and he's going to fit right into their scheme of things. Green Bay is up at this point. We chatted about their situation earlier and that uh, Bart Starr has one year remaining on the contract. They need a wide receiver. They need help on the offensive line. Uh, they have not drafted well. They had no starters, Bud, coming out of last year's draft. Well, I think they'll pick a starter this time. They really are in a situation, aside from personnel, where I think uh, the public, uh, the fans of public, publicly held corporations, uh, they won't stand for this much longer, will they? Well, one of the problems with the Packers last year is some of the guys they drafted were hurt, and one went to Canada, Bruce Clark. Obviously. George Cumbie got hurt. Mark Lee, the cornerback drafted on the second round, got hurt. And that's where the Packers really had troubles last year was it w was an injuries more than anything else. And this really sets up now the Rams as the, these other selections go down. Uh, they still will have that quarterback they want available in the ninth selection right now. That's right. It's going to be interesting, really. And Hugh Green is, is becoming the key to this all because the Rams will be able to get Campbell uh, or even Lomax. Both of them are probably going to be there. But maybe Hugh Green will still be there. <laughs> it, 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 that we'll one pick is really thrown it out. But well, Ken Easley, just one more point. Uh, it's a rare thing to have somebody who can play both corner and safety. Usually, you can play one or the other, and that's a luxury to have a can go either way. So the recapping, once again, mm -hmm. the, the initial picks, George Rogers, as selected, went in the first pick uh, to New Orleans. The Giants selecting Lawrence Taylor. Third selection belonging to the New York Jets. They went for the uh, multi-purpose running back, Freeman McNeil out of UCLA. Then Seattle selecting defensive back Ken Easley. Seattle uh, making their selection rather quickly. In fact, the first three selections, if you were with us, made in the span of about four minutes. E.J. Jr., as the St. Louis Cardinals went right down to the final moment, the Cardinals handed up to Commissioner Pete Rozelle exactly as their 15 minutes would expire. They went for the linebacker, actually the defensive end, but he'll be a linebacker in the pros, E.J. Jr., and uh, Green Bay has, by our reckoning, about uh, eight minutes left on their selection. Howard? Very quickly, one thing uh, that I've heard on San Francisco is that the 49ers wanted Lott or Easley. And Lott is probably going to go, end up going now, I think, before the 49ers pick. And you might see San Francisco trade, try to trade their pick at least to another team to get some extra picks somewhere down the line, like they did last year twice. Of course, uh, Washington has selections looking way down there, number 20. It's Cincinnati has the 10th overall pick. Paul, do you think that you mentioned earlier about possibly the Bills making a move? Is anybody else you think in the lower rungs of the first round, seeing these developments now, seeing Green available, is someone going to make a grab now and, and try and make that trade with someone, say, who is 7 through 12 who could still have a shot at Green? I really don't think so, but I, I have to just admire L.A. for their, for their going from 20 down to 9. And the way things are happening, it just shows how smart they really were. Yep. They're in, in a great position to get what they want a quarterback. It's all going to work out possibly for the Rams. They may have a quarterback filled the ninth position. Let's go back now to New York City and George Brown. George? Thank you, Bob. Commissioner Pete Rozelle. Green Bay Packers. First round choice. California quarterback Rich Campbell. Next up. There's the first quarterback selected in this 1981 NFL draft. Rich Campbell, the quarterback from the University of California at Berkeley. Uh, Campbell, as you know, uh, set records for pass completion percentage, 70% in a season, over 60%, 64% for his career. The big question mark on Rich Campbell was his knee. He had ligament surgery last year, did not last the season, but according to all the statistics and all the timings that they've had with him, he's 100%. And that's why they rank him ahead of Neil Lomax from a quarterback standpoint. Uh, I wonder if uh, this choice really will uh, satisfy the fans in Green Bay. It seems to be a public kind of pick. We have a, a coach who was, of course, a great quarterback who was one year remaining on his contract. And it, it, I guess the fans really can't knock this choice. And you can't knock the Packers for picking Campbell because they have two quarterbacks that are now in their 30s. We don't know what the fans in uh, Green Bay. Hold on, here we go, Tampa Bay. Choice, Hugh Green, linebacker, Pittsburgh. Next up, San Francisco 49ers. So Hugh Green has gone to Tampa Bay. There is your linebacker. Uh, we 
mentioned that Rich Campbell went to Green Bay, the number six selection. Uh, Tampa Bay, the number seven selection. Just Hugh Green. Uh, up in the gallery, Leandro Riley. We don't know what the people in Green Bay are saying right now about the selection of Campbell, but we do know what the people here in New York are saying. Leandro, what's the reaction to Rich Campbell in Green Bay? Okay, with me is Joe Kurz, and he's, I guess you could say, ditching work. You were a little surprised at the Green Bay selection. Yes, I was. I was looking for them to take someone who could help them right away and get them in the playoffs this season. But You don't think Campbell can do that? No, no, it's definitely a move for the future, and it was a move they made because, well, they got rid of Starr so they can make this move. So I guess they figured Starr would pick someone who could help them right away. It was a good move, though, because it will, in years to come, it will pay off. Okay, you said that the offensive line, the defensive back, needs some strength. Who do you think they should go with next time? In the second round? Long shot it depends away. who's available. So, uh, I don't know, Dixon, if he's available. If Dixon's available, okay, we're going to keep an eye out for that. And let's go back to George Grand and get some reactions, maybe, about the Tampa Bay situation. Thanks, Leandra. As it stands right now, uh, Mark Campbell Burns is going to Green Bay, the first quarterback to go in the draft. He comes from a great tradition. Joe Roth, Bartkowski from California. Ron Barr is in Oakland with this reaction on someone who should know about Campbell. Here at the Raider headquarters, we've just learned Rich Campbell is going to be playing his professional football at Green Bay. And with us is the head coach of the Cal Bears, the man that coached Rich Campbell, Roger Theater. Roger, what about Rich going to Green Bay? How will he fit in with their program? Well, I, of course, I think Rich would fit in anywhere. I, we think he's in the mold of some of the great quarterbacks that we've had, uh, very similar to a Bartkowski. I have no doubt that Rich is going to be a tremendous asset to the Green Bay organization. Okay, the reporting uh, reports that we have on Campbell is that he can't throw long. He's accurate within 30 yards. Can you uh, talk about that? Well, I'll tell you, if there isn't a pass that Rich Campbell uh, can't throw, I, I've never seen uh, a situation like that. I, I think in our case last year when people uh, – we're saying that about Rich. The problem we had, uh, he's such a great quarterback that every game we played uh, seemed like when the ball was snapped, the defensive backs were running for the other goal line. And we didn't have the great speed, the Wesley Walkers that we've had. So I think that's the reason people were saying, because Rich really didn't do it. Okay, thank you. Rather than the Redskins. All right, the other trade. The Los Angeles Rams trade linebacker Bro Bob Brzezinski and a second round draft choice in this draft which is the last pick in the second round that the rams previously acquired from oakland so they trade brzezinski and their pick which is the last choice in the second round to the miami dolphins in return for three draft choices the dolphins second and third picks in this draft and a second round pick in 1982 next year's draft that the dolphins previously acquired from tampa bay all right i'll review that for you rams trade linebacker bob brudzinski and a second round choice in this draft which is the last pick in the second round the rams had previously acquired from oakland to the miami dolphins in return for three choices the dolphins second and third picks <clears throat> in this draft and a second round choice in 1982 the Dolphins previously acquired from Tampa Bay yeah. there you have it that's Commissioner Pete Rozelle and as we were coming back we didn't want to interrupt two trades announced to recap uh, neither one of them have to do with this first round but uh, both of them uh, rather important because they involve uh, significant names Joe Washington from Baltimore to the Redskins Washington hopefully uh, wants to put their running back situation back in check. It was horrendous last year. Joe Theismann had nothing to do um, with anyone behind him simply because he had no running power, no running game at all behind him. Uh, so they hope to put that back together again. And as far as Brzezinski is concerned, um, Paul Zimmerman, there's been no secret. Uh, Brzezinski has been on the shopping block all week long, uh, peddled to, to anybody who would talk about possible moving up in the draft. I... Uh I sort of figured Buffalo would be the team because I knew they were they were very tight and tough knocks like the Jets from the LA days. Uh, Miami was a sort of outside possibility. Everybody said no. Shula doesn't like people who walk out of camp, but I guess he does. I guess uh, the loss of John Riggins last year certainly was devastating to Washington. I don't know that Joe Washington 
uh, can uh, remedy that, but he can at least add some offense to that backfield. Well, uh, the thing that Riggins did so well, and what Washington also does so well, is running that player route out of the backfield. I mean, they're a terrific, terrific receiving target. I, mean, I saw a game in Washington caught 13 ball. Uh, that's going to be a, a real shot in the arm for that dump off passing game. I had the same feeling that you did about Buffalo and Brzezinski because Isaiah Robertson has been a washout. They're paying him big bucks. Uh, the big question was, will they get Cousineau back? We probably won't know until May if he comes back from the CFL. Uh, but this might be an indication that they feel they can get him back. Yeah, but then you have the where he doesn't play. Uh, and then they have that 3-4. Uh, uh, he's been playing inside up there. I would assume he's inside. I mean, the man they have to replace is obviously Robertson. And maybe they see Cousineau can play on the outside. I don't know. I, I don't think Robertson was a washout. I think they, they just did... Uh, he just did what they wanted when they, he, he was a little better than the guy he replaced. Of course, the problem on the team is the big money. All right, the draft selection process right now. The two trades that have been announced in the last couple of minutes. Joe Washington goes to the Washington Redskins. There you see the clock with 10 minutes remaining on the next selection in the draft, which is the San Francisco 49ers. And the other trade, the Rams send Brzezinski to the Dolphins. Uh, Brzezinski plus a second round pick, which is the last pick. Uh, to the Dolphins for three picks. The Dolphins' second and third round picks of this year and a number two in 1982. Uh, and if you were uh, listening to Ron Barr in Oakland, we did come out rather rapidly just to give you a picture of what's happening with the trade. Obviously, uh, uh, this activity is a little bit of a telethon. It's a little bit of a news story. It's a little bit of play-by-play. -play. It's a little bit of everything. And that's what we're going to be trying to do all day long, first of all and foremost, keep you abreast of what's happening here from a news standpoint. And secondly, as you look at the San Francisco table uh, with uh, Roy Gilbert and the rest of the crew there waiting to make their pick as we're under 10 minutes now. And secondly, to get the color of what's happening as well. Our first object is from a news standpoint to fill you in on what happens minute by minute. The second object to give you the color of it. And as we heard in Oakland, um, the people out there feel that uh, uh, Rich Campbell can very definitely be another page in the great history of California quarterbacks. And uh, speaking about uh, the West Coast, I know it's very early in the morning out there. Uh, all this wheeling and dealing by the Rams, according to my figures, the Rams at this point still have eight picks in the first five rounds. And they rat now with these two picks, they leapfrog ahead of New Orleans with a total number of picks. I believe they now have 19 picks ahead uh, coming in with these extra picks. Now they had a total of 19 picks, so uh, they would leapfrog ahead of, of the Saints as far as the most total number of picks in this year's draft. We'll be back with more of ESPN's exclusive live coverage of the 1981 National Football League Collegiate Draft after this word. Give me some men who are stout-hearted men who will fight for the right they adore. Reviewing exactly what has happened so far in the first round as we await the selection of San Francisco. They have about five minutes remaining. George Rogers, the first selection by New Orleans, the running back out of South Carolina. The Giants immediately thereafter selecting Lawrence Taylor, the linebacker from North Carolina. The Jets took no more than a minute to make their selection. Freeman McNeil, the running back from UCLA. Then Seattle taking about nine minutes to finally select Kenny Easley, the defensive back from UCLA. Fourteen minutes later, just under the gun, the Cards picking E.J. Jr., the linebacker from Alabama. And about eight minutes following that, the Packers going for the quarterback out of California, Rich Campbell, who might step right in as a starter this year for the Packers. And the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, Hugh Green. Linebacker out of Pittsburgh. That's where we stand for the moment. Let's go back to New York City and George Graham. Thank you, Bob. There you see the clock. Six minutes and counting for the San Francisco 49ers pick. Paul Zimmerman. We have San Francisco, and then after that, Los Angeles with the uh, pick that they acquired in the trade with Washington. Those are the next two ones up, San Francisco and L.A. Uh, testing, one, two, three, four, five. This is the hand mic. L.A. Uh, was already drafted. And uh, that's, that's not only this year, but for the next three years, they're on a solid business from the second. Well, here's the pick. Let's go back to the commission. Defensive back, Ronnie Lott, USC. Next choice, the first round, belongs to the Los Angeles Rams. Previously acquired from Washington Redskins. There you have it, Ronnie Lott of the Trojans, taken by San Francisco. He'll stay on the West Coast, Paul. Yeah, uh, well, of course, it was Lott or Easley for uh, San Francisco. They wanted Easley, but they thought it was Lott. But the point about L.A., uh, what are they going to do with all these drafts? I mean, they, they have a, a, a team of stars. 
it's a veteran team, only four or five rookies are going to make it. What do they need them all for? Uh, I mean, just a uh, collection, like an antique show or something? Um, I think they were smart when they upgraded for a four and a two. Everybody said they gave up too much, but what, you know, they're, they're just going to save themselves the bonus money. Why do they want to pay all these bonuses and then have to cut these guys in camp so somebody else can get them? I think, I think they should trade a lot of these and, and pick up team old veterans and just spot them in the net like Dallas did. This was, uh, with Don Klosterman and Dick Steinberg, uh, one of the most respected uh, draft teams. Steinberg is gone, Klosterman, of course, is still there. How do you rank this team now? You mean... Uh, From a draft selection standpoint. L.A.? Yes. Well, I don't know. Uh, you're always looking at it in hindsight. I think I think L.A. is pretty Price. solid. Eric I mean, they, they didn't they didn't get all those, those draft choices through accident. They, they had some smart people there. Um, the, the Green Bay trade, the, the, the blockbuster one where Hato went there, that was Chuck Knox. Uh, New Orleans had talked to him about it. Uh, Chuck Knox, uh, you know, turned around and did it. But, uh, you know, they didn't pick up all those extra drafts by being stupid. All right, Washington trades their pick for the Rams. The Rams are now up in the number nine position. Following that will come the Cincinnati Bengals uh, for their selection process. Ron Barr is giving us the picture from the West Coast standpoint. We've already heard from Rich Campbell's coach. Let's go back to Ron Barr and see what's cooking. San Francisco 49er coach Bill Walsh said that he wanted to get either Kenny Easley or Ronnie Lott. Easley goes to Seattle. Ronnie Lott goes to the 49ers. With me is Ray Ratto of the San Francisco Examiner. Do you feel that was a good choice, or maybe they should have gotten some uh, backup help for Paul Hofer, who's out with a bad injury? No, they had a serious defensive secondary problem last year and the year before. They had to get a defensive secondary man. And I think they're probably pleasantly surprised that Lot lasted as long as they did. The way the draft was sort of penciled out in everybody's mind here was that both Lot and Easley would go earlier than they did. What about the pressure put on a young player? Bill needs to have somebody in that secondary who can play immediately. Is Lot that type of ball player? Lot's a, a marvelous player. Um, having seen him for a couple years straight now at SC, he's the sort of guy that he's, he's an intimidator. He makes you want to run a different route than, than is designed. Um, he and Dennis Smith, the other secondary man at, uh, at SC, were an excellent tandem. And had it not been for uh, Kenny Easley being right across the street at, uh, at Westwood, Ronnie Lott probably would have been considered you know, the best secondary man in the Pac-10. Ray, candidly, how much will this help the 49ers defense this year? A little bit, not much. I mean, there are a lot of things that they've got to get. Um, you know, their shopping list was fairly long. Uh, secondary just hap happened to be at the top of the list. Um, for people who are expecting Ronnie Lott to immediately turn it around, have the kind of year that Lester Hayes had, it's very unreasonable because the 49ers are still a team you can throw against. Uh, Ronnie Lott is good, but I don't think he's going to make an amazing difference where where they won't need any more help. They've got to get a couple more people back there. Okay, thanks a lot. Ray Ratto of the San Francisco Examiner. Thank you, guys. That's the commissioner. We busted away from Oakland again. The picture here, Los Angeles, the number nine selection. They picked Mel Owens, the linebacker from Michigan. Somewhat of a surprise, Paul Zimmerman. Two teams I know like them very much, Miami and uh, Oakland. There were others, but I think he's one of these guys that came up late, like, like E.J. Jr. The more they thought about him, the more they looked at his stats, the more late exams he gave him, the higher he got. Uh, maybe even up to the huge man level. Two months ago, you wouldn't have heard that, but he was a late bloomer. Okay, there you have it. That's the pick for the Los Angeles Rams. Mel Owens, a linebacker out of Michigan. And with a number one selection in this 1981 National Football League draft, Sal Marciano is with George Rogers. Sal? Thank you very much, George. With me is the number one pick in the NFL draft, the George Rogers running back, South Carolina. George has just escaped from uh, dozens and dozens of reporters. And I'm sure the obvious question is, uh, how much do you look forward to playing for the Saints? <laughs> well, um, just as much as the other guys look forward to playing for the team that they got picked with. Uh, a lot of people say that, you know, I wish, I better, I'd be lucky if we win two games, you know, when I, when we walk in, uh, walk around and stuff, you know, around the motel. Yeah. Of course, you know, <laughs> they say that about all the other teams too, but I'm looking forward to playing like New Orleans. Eric Price, our big. You know, we can be better than um, we did last year. Uh, a lot of people might think that uh, the number one pick could uh, 
change the whole team. I'm not going in New Orleans thinking I can change the team. If, uh, if anything, it's going to have to be the team change the team. And I'll be a part of that. And that's, that's my concern. I, I want to win just like everybody else. I read where you are an admirer of Bump Phillips. Yeah. Uh, I, I think one of the reasons probably because uh, he's Earl, you know, he coached Errol Hamill. Errol's you know, one of my favorites. I look up to guys like Earl. It's, it's pretty good show. You know, be coach of, you know, be coach of one of one of the traditional coaches. You know, that's been in the game for a real long time. Uh, two uh, small matters, perhaps not small, perhaps significant. You had a wrist injury uh, this past season. Uh, how did that come along? Uh, it's come. You mean how it's come along now? It's come along fine. You know, uh, most of the time I hurt my wrist because uh, I fall on the ground and try to catch my bounce. If I take them up real good, they don't hardly get hurt out most of the time. The other factor I want to talk about is the synthetic turf uh, in the Superdome. Uh, how do you feel about playing on that? I like, I like playing on the turf. It kind of like speeds the game up. Uh, I play on that turf in Columbia. So I, I, uh, maybe, maybe it's a different. Cincinnati on the first round. Wide receiver David Versu from Kansas. Chicago Bears are up. The man you see right there is Don Weiss, who is the assistant to the commissioner. He just announced that Cincinnati has taken David Burser, the wide receiver out of Kansas. He has been regarded as one of the foremost uh, wide receivers in a draft where there are a number of wide receivers that are ranked near the top. Burser has been uh, ranked near the top from the very beginning. Now, next up, the Cincinnati Bengals. Let's take a look and see how they match up. Greg Gumbel takes a look at their history in the draft. The Cincinnati Bengals are a tough nut to crack. They are hard to understand. The Bengals have done it the way it's supposed to be done, through the draft. Yet the results aren't showing on the field. Look at the Bengals' recent draft history. It is amazing. 19 of their 22 starters have come through the draft the last six years. You see stats like that and figure since he should be challenging in the AFC Central, but they haven't. Why? Well, four different head coaches since 1975 for one reason, and many experts feel the Bengals just don't have enough of the talented veterans to pull the youngsters together. They have had their premium errors. They cut number two pick linebacker Kirby Criswell last year, but Anthony Munoz is a future all-pro at tackle. They have also had their problems as far back as 77, where they had Mike Cobb and Voight. They had two in 76 go by the wayside, but Rod Horn and Bill Glass were big contributors on the special teams last year. They are expected to do better this this year. What's the answer for the Bengals? Perhaps some stability among the coaching staff for one thing, and if the Bengals have still another good draft this year, maybe this is the year they will again win more games than they lose. Thank you very much, Greg Gumbel. As the uh, story is completed here from the standpoint of the, the first selections, the first ten selections, uh, as it stands right now, George Rogers to the Saints. Uh, Taylor, Lawrence Taylor to the Giants, the linebacker, Freeman McNeil, the running back of UCLA to the Jets, Kenny Easley, the, the defensive back from uh, the UCLA Bruins, also goes to um, Seattle in the first four selections. We just heard Cincinnati, they took David Burser as well. We've got a lot of football today, and we also have a lot of tennis coming up for you this evening. In case you missed it last night, Brian Gottfried in a match uh, against a very game, Tony Giamalva. Gottfried came home the winner in match number one, of the first round of the WCT Tennis Championship. Uh, tonight, another great match, John McEnroe, the defending champion, will be uh, heading up the field as Jim Simpson and Cliff Drysdale were at their best last night. We'll be back tonight to bring us live coverage of the WCT from Big D in Dallas. From the Big NY in New York, we'll be back with more of the National Football League 1981 player selection. We're waiting on the Chicago Bears. Ticking next, the clock winds down to 12 minutes plus for the Bears selection. That's National Football League Commissioner Pete Rosell talking with Al Ward from the Commissioner's Office. The selection has just been made for the Chicago Bears. Pete Van Horn, the tackle from the University of California, Southern California from USC. Did that match up with what you felt? Uh, it was, it was uh, what I got two weeks ago was Randy McMillan, a pit, a slight edge over Van Horn, which Van Horn calls his pass. 
I thought they would go for McMillan to give Peyton the big back uh, next to him. I guess they felt that putting the big tackle in front of him was important. We talked uh, with George Hallis uh, during the, the winter just a couple of months ago, and he said he has more or less stayed out of the football operations in recent years. But he said this year, with the offensive problems that they've had, they've ranked near the bottom of the league the last couple of years. He said he decided to step in. It was his move and his impetus that brought uh, Ted Marchabrota in as the overall offensive coordinator. What kind of an effect is that going to have on the Chicago offense? Well, the knock on Marchabrota in Baltimore was that he was too conservative. And now they brought him in to liven up an office that was too conservative. Well, unless he's got a complete change of philosophy, or they make him change his philosophy, I don't see where that's a great progression. He's done great wonders with some outstanding quarterbacks in years past. They hope that he can do the same with Vince Evans, I gather. I think that's what they got him for. Uh, I think when you have a Peyton, uh, you're not going to go to a classy office and really around the quarterback. And now the receiver from Minus Jim and Scott, so they're in trouble there. Uh, I, think, I think they've got to build a something around Peyton like Buffalo did with OJ a few years ago. The top three running backs. Uh, we knew Rodgers and McNeil were near the top. McMillan was also ranked right there. Are you surprised McMillan hasn't gone as yet? I'm shocked. Man, he's going to go right now. Okay, you think he's up this time? I think Baltimore will take him. All right, that's Randy McMillan we were talking about from Pittsburgh. Let's go back up to the gallery and see what the fans are doing here at the Sheraton in New York. Leandra. What? With me is John Lopazanski, and he's a carpenter who's playing hooky from work to uh, to look at the draft. I guess the fans aren't doing too well. Not Selection too wise, it's 12. How you doing? Uh, not too well. There's been a lot of surprises. Everybody's been changing. Nobody's been uh, picking who I think I was, we should be picked. I guess your first surprise came with Los Angeles after losing Ferragamo. Well, that was correct. Being that Ferragamo went to uh, Canada to play, he figured in the uh, next quarterback they would take was Lomax. That was a big surprise in itself right there. And Chicago didn't pick a quarterback either. No, they didn't. No. Uh, Chicago picked uh, Van Horn. I had him, but that's only my fourth one, correct. <laughs> okay, we're ready to hear Pete Rosell give us our next choice, so let's go back to the podium. Here's Baltimore Colts, first round selection. Baltimore picks Randy McMillan, <laughs> Pittsburgh, University of Pittsburgh running back. Running back Randy McMillan taken up, Randy as the number 12 pick, as you indicated, Paul Zimmerman. Uh, so far, we've been pretty much on the money here with Paul Zimmerman. We've also have been pretty much on the money back in Bristol, the way we've been evaluating as well. Randy McMillan taken number 12 for Baltimore from Pittsburgh, the running back. Now, next up, the Miami Dolphins from a draft standpoint. Greg Gumbel, as we told you, has been putting together an evaluation of the teams as they have done during the course of the last couple of years from a draft standpoint. And we'll be taking a look at that if time allows when we return. But first, let's take a break as we continue ESPN's coverage of the 1981 National Football League player draft. The clock winds down 14 minutes plus for the Miami Dolphins pick. So I have just about, just about, just about everything I'm most sure about now. I really want to. There you see the clock winding down, 11 minutes plus and counting. This for the Miami Dolphins, pick number 13 in the first round. The Dolphins in their history. Greg Gumbel takes a look at their pick process. When it comes to handling personnel, few teams do a better job of it than Don Shula and the Miami Dolphins. Their drafting has been nearly flawless in the last few years. Look at the charts. They show 17 starters on the Dolphins coming in via the draft. Two in 1980, cornerback Don McNeil and the steal of the year. Eighth round pick quarterback David Woodley, who became a starter and will remain Miami's starting quarterback for quite some time. Number two and number three picks, Dwight Stevenson and Bill Barnett. The coaches figure to go to them more this season. In 1979, Miami did everything right. Seven starters out of that draft. Premium errors, the Dolphins have made them. Mel Land on the third round in 79, Lyman Smith on the third round in 78 among them. But the Dolphins have done such an all-around superb job in the draft, it more than balances. Any more drafts like the Dolphins had in 79, and the Dolphins will be a virtual power not only in the AFC East, but in the National Football League, just like the old days. Thanks, Greg Gumbel. Back at the Grand Ballroom at the Sheridan Hotel in New York City. You are looking at the floor of the Grand Ballroom. The 28 tables representing the 28 National Football League teams. We've had a lot of firsts here at ESPN since we hit the air in September of 79. And we'd like to uh, uh, wish congratulations to 
uh, an individual who's had a number of firsts as well, along with Jim McKay, Howard Cosell, uh, just celebrated uh, the Wide World of Sports 20th anniversary this past weekend. Congratulations on a do job well done, and Sal Marciano is with Humble Howard right now. Sal. If the National Football League and network television has a sex symbol, it is the wizard of words, the coach of the cosmos, the most recognizable man in America today, Howard Cosell. What is your opinion of the way the National Football League uh, dips into collegiate talent every year? I think Pete Rozelle should win a Tony Award, an Emmy Award, and an Oscar Award for creating the most overrated, over-propagandized annual event in American sport. He's got to be accredited as a marketing genius. I think it's simply wonderful the way the print medium joins in as the principal sub-thumpers of this nothing event. And I also think it's remarkable that the fans up in the galleries can be so sold and so utterly naive and unknowledgeable. The record of the annual draft speaks for itself. Let's take last year. Rams took Johnson, Texas, defensive back, first round. Almost destroyed their team. Rebellion, walkouts. They succeeded in losing their first two games to the inferior Detroit and Tampa Bay teams. The Jets, Lamb Jones, bust. The Giants, Haynes, defensive back, bust. As a matter of fact, as one reviews the history of the annual draft and what the New York teams have done, nothing has helped them less. I have in mind the memorable Rocky Thompson for the Giants. I suggest, since Burgess Owens wants a number one draft choice with the Jets and Otis McKinney wants a number two draft choice with the Giants, since they made it and made it big with the Oakland Raiders, I suggest all teams get down to the nub of the matter. They shouldn't draft players. They should draft Al Davis. Uh, this draft actually is supposed to help teams that don't win very much, but isn't it in fact the case that the rich teams get richer through trades and improving their position? Not the rich teams. The teams with the best organization. The Oakland Raiders, the team of reclamation projects, as I've already indicated, because of Al Davis. The Rams will stay good because Klosterman has stockpiled so many draft choices through the years that he's got an abundance of talent. The Cowboys will always be good because of Gil Brandt and Tex Schramm. The Patriots will be consistently good because of Bucko Kilroy and now Dick Steinberg. The Redskins will get better because of Bobby Becker. It lies in organization, and you know that, Sal. You've been around a long time. Not You're my position. guy. <laughs> One other question, and that is, what do you think is the significance of the CFL signing Ferragamo? Not to the teams, but I'm talking about the two leagues. I don't think there is any significance. I think it's a terrible mistake by Ferragamo. I think the double zero number he wears is reflective of his mentality. He will die in Canada. He has no mobility, and a quarterback without mobility in Canada is really subject to physical assault. The acquisition of James Scott is palpably meaningless. Always a pleasure to talk to Mr. Howard Cosell. Now let's go back to George. Thank you, Sal. Uh, as you saw, the commissioner, Commissioner Pete Rozelle, was uh, watching that interview. We have television monitors around the room. He was watching it as it came, and you saw the, the look on his face. Uh, one thing about the commissioner, uh, he knows what it's like in the big time because he is the big time, and he, he can take it tongue-in-cheek either way. Uh, he can take it and he can dish it out too, Paul Zimmerman. Well, I just want to uh, comment on what Howard said. Uh, it is meaningless compared to such wide world of sport events such as the stock car racing in Darlington and the motorcycle hill climbs. I mean, uh, we've got some blockbuster events there. Uh, pro football is only America's number one sport, and this is only the most important stockpiling event of the year. So maybe you can, you can excuse some of those gallery people for being tuned in. Tell you one other thing, uh, Atlanta will, will not uh, adhere to that because the Atlanta Falcons went from six and ten uh, last year when they had the, the good draft to twelve and four this time around and the playoffs. We'll continue with the 1981 National Football League Collegiate Player Draft after this word.
would like to welcome all the folks watching us at the Baltimore Convention Center, where United Cable is bringing our signal in today. We understand there's a crowd of about 500, hopefully up around 1,000 people to watch the Colts as they uh, draft action for the NFL draft. There's uh, the folks in Baltimore with us. We'd like to recap again the trades that have been made. The trade Baltimore running back Joe Washington traded to the Redskins in return for Baltimore's pick in the second round, the number 24 pick overall in the second round. And the Los Angeles Rams have traded linebacker Bob Brzezinski and a second-round pick in this year's draft. Prior to this, it was Oakland's pick, the last pick in the second round. That pick and Brzezinski to Miami in return for the Dolphins' second and third-round picks in this draft and a number two pick next year that had belonged prior to Tampa Bay. So uh, that's exactly what the Rams have done. They have moved up now in rounds two and three, and that relates to their first-round selection, Mel Owens, the linebacker out of Michigan, who uh, it was thought, Howard, that they would go for a quarterback, the Rams. Now they have the better position in the next two rounds to make a move towards a quarterback. Or a running back like they wanted McNeil, and Owens is a good selection because Jack Reynolds, the linebacker, is nearing the end of his career. Uh, we're waiting on uh, the next selection for Miami. Of course, they have made those deals. Keith Van Horn selected by Chicago. Van Horn on the offensive line. There's been talk of possibly Paul Ted Watts being selected, the, the great Texas Tech defensive back, but the offensive tackle move, despite the fact that Scott signed yesterday with the NOS. Yeah, the, the funny thing, I was just talking to Bud, I said, Chicago's going to have the biggest line in professional football. If you can imagine the story and the, and, and the two the big guards that they have in Chicago, now with Van Horn there, uh, they're going to have an awesome offensive line, and with Walter Payton behind there. Okay. Goodbye, everybody. I think they're moving Ted Albrecht yeah. to guard. That's one of their plans. <laughs> the Bengals uh, have selected uh, in this round David Verser, a uh, running back, a uh, rather wide receiver out of Kansas, just to recap some of the other selections made so far in this first round. Ronnie Lott, the defensive back, uh, chosen by San Francisco. And again, those trades. So if you're keeping score with us at home, in the second round, Los Angeles now has the 15th pick overall. Baltimore has the 24th pick overall. And Miami has the final selection in the second round. And again, if you're scoring with us at home in the third round, just note that Los Angeles has the 14th pick, not Miami, as a result of some of the trades. Time is winding down in New York City. The Miami Dolphins uh, are uh, getting towards that time. They have to make a selection. As we said, uh, let's go down now to New York City and get this word now from George Brown. Thanks, Bob. Grand Ballroom, Commissioner Pete Rozelle. Miami Dolphins, first round choice, David Overstreet, running back, Oklahoma. Next up, Kansas City Chiefs. I take more than all. So, David Overstreet, and uh, that was a bit of a surprise here in our telecast center. David Overstreet from running back, you say, nah, how it was all Define that, yeah. <laughs> Please. <laughs> Nothing ever surprises me. The Dolphins were interested in Randy McMillan, but Overstreet, I think, is going to be an excellent pro. He didn't run that much at Oklahoma because of the way the offense right. is structured there, but he can block, he can catch, he can run, of course, and he's going to help the Dolphins. The interesting thing, Neil Lomax, where is he going to go? And uh, he could go to Denver in a couple picks, with Kansas City now taking either a wide receiver or a tight end. Okay, KC is up. The clock is running. They have a need for a tight end, and they have that selection also in the third round. Los Angeles pick will pick up our coverage of the 1981 NFL Draft here on ESPN after these commercial messages. Before we went down to Roselle. He's the best tight end in the draft. Fine player, good all-around performer, and uh, they've got a super uh, premium player there. Okay, now with the Miami situation, they did take a running back. That was a surprise. Why? You had uh, uh, some feelings about that. Uh, yes, but I read somewhere that uh, Miami has a halfback who's had certain uh, personal problems and wants to be traded or whatever, and that, that would account for the fact that Miami switched to a running back. Okay, Willie Scott was just chosen. I'd like to add about George Parker. Someday when he grows up, he would like to be a, an agent representative someday in the NFL. So uh, let's go back to George Grand and get some reactions to the Willie Scott selection. There are a whole lot of people that want a piece of that action. There's Jim Heffernan, Heffern the uh, uh, director of media information for the National Football League. He's one of the individuals who's waiting for cards from the tables, and then we'll bring that back to the commissioner. We are waiting now for the Denver Broncos. And Paul Zimmerman, the question with the Denver Broncos, uh, 38 years of age is Craig Morton. They traded for Robinson. He did not have a good year last year. Could this be the first shot for Neil Lomax to go? But uh, we know coming into the draft that they wanted a wide receiver. So where do they go from here? 
Well, as far as uh, being married to Matt Robinson, just remember that it was a different regime, regime that made that trade. Uh, nobody involved in is, is around, so they don't have to feel responsible for that if they go and draft Neil Lomax, that's their business. But uh, they indicated to me they wanted to go either wide receiver or Willie Scott if he was there. Uh, I have an order of preference here. Bursa was number one, he's gone. Willie Scott, number two, he's gone. Then they like uh, Nichols, the receiver for San Jose, and Marty Mitchell, another receiver. So oh, right I'm, I'm down at Nichols and Mitchell. Yeah. Lomax, uh, did you think it would go this far before he went? Yeah, I had him projected in New England. Okay. All right, we shall see if he does come up in New England. The commissioner ready to make the selection for Denver, this in the first round. Commissioner Pete Rozelle at the podium. Denver Broncos. Denver Broncos, first round choice. Dennis Smith, defensive back, USC. Next up, Detroit Lions. The third University of Southern California athlete to be selected so far in this polling among the top 15. As Denver picks number 15, Dennis Smith, the defensive back out of USC. He was regarded as one of the top three defensive prospects, along with Ronnie Lott, who has already gone, and along with Ken Easley. All three of them from Los Angeles, incidentally. One from UCLA, two from USC. So Denver is pick number 15. We wait for the Detroit Lions. Their history is an interesting one. Last year, they selected number one with Billy Sims. Let's take a look and see how Marty Clark has done in his regime in Detroit. Well, to the beat of another one bites the dust, the Detroit Lions did begin to turn things around last football season. And all due congratulations go out to head coach Marty Clark and to his personnel man, Tim Rooney. But that's a job only half completed. Of the Lions, 22 starters, 12 have come via the draft. Four through free agency, six more on trade. In his three years in Detroit, Clark has plucked nine starters out of the draft, and that's not bad. Last year, of course, a banner year with running back Billy Sims, who was everything he was supposed to be, and then some. On the seventh round, the Lions grabbed a pretty good kicker in Ed Murray. They did make a mistake, his only mistake among the premium selections. He cut third-round choice Mike Freed, who looked pretty good with the Giants before he was injured. Clark also had a fine number one selection in 79, tackle Keith Dorney, and in 78, four draftees made their way into the Detroit lineup. The bottom line on all of this, Clark and Rooney are doing the job as it should be done through the draft. The only thing is they will need another good draft this year to keep up in the NFC's black and blue division. The Detroit Lions ready to make selection number 16. We should put a, make a mention, though, even though they were 9-7 and seven last year, they did benefit from the year before after that number one selection of the parity schedule. In other words, uh, uh, after the bad season, they ended up with an easier schedule. They still did not make the playoffs, even though they did improve to 9-7, and seven, but they did not make the playoffs, even though they started off red hot. Amani Clark and Tim Rooney are waiting now uh, for their selection process. How do you evaluate the... Uh, Tim Rooney as a selector from a draft standpoint, Paul Zimmerman? Well, Tim, Tim comes from that Pittsburgh system, uh, which is good, as you know. Uh, he comes from a solid football background. Uh, he's very knowledgeable. Uh, of course, you have to ask who has the real input. Uh, I'm sure he, he uh, supplies information. I don't know who makes the final choice there. I think the coach probably has a lot to do with it. Maybe the general manager. I know last year... Uh, Russ Thomas? Yeah. Uh, Gary Denver can see Thomas of knowing in places where he shouldn't. So uh, uh, I think they're a pretty solid drafting team. Not spectacular, not bad. Who do you uh, see in picking? Well, now, um, I haven't been doing too well, have I? Uh, Robin Sandline, linebacker. I'm giving you a chance to make up here, you know that. I'm taking a way out <laughs> shot. That's, that's like a bet my team on that. Okay, Robin Sandline. The commissioner is ready at the podium for the Detroit Lions pick. Detroit Lions. Lions first round selection. Mark Nichols, wide receiver, San Jose State. Next up, Pittsburgh Steelers. Mark Nichols, the wide receiver from San Jose State, regarded again as, as one of the premier wide receivers available in this draft. There were no less than a half dozen of them who were regarded uh, quite highly. David Verster, Marty McDowell, Mark Nichols, um, as well as Kenny Marjoram from Stanford. Uh, Nichols at six foot, 209 pounds, good size for 200 pounds, and that's the factor. So we are through 16 picks thus far in this first round of the National Football League 81 selection process. The next pick comes with the Pittsburgh Steelers. We'll be back with that one after this word as our exclusive draft coverage continues. 
see the floor of the Grand Ballroom at the Sheraton in New York. And while it's football today and tennis tonight, don't forget, come Saturday, live coverage of the North American Soccer League, Seattle at Vancouver. This should be an interesting matchup. It was last year that Vancouver was knocked out of the playoffs by Seattle. We shall see what happens. Seattle, one of the powerhouses last year, winning 25 games in the NASL. Sal? We are set uh, for pick number 17 with Pittsburgh. Uh, I'm told now that Hank uh, Stram is with Sam Rosen. Let's uh, check in. Okay, thank you very much, Sal. And Hank Stram uh, is here uh, with CBS Radio Network. Hank, of course, watching the NFL very closely. Former coach. Hank, what's going on on the other side now, the other end of these telephone lines, back in the, in the front offices? Well, Sam, they, you know, all the heavy work has really been done uh, during the offseason, so everything is written down, everything is calculated very precisely, and uh, you have a list of 100 people to begin with, and you, uh, as people are picked, you cross off those names and put them on another board, and you keep abreast of what's happening and what's remaining, and uh, you know who you want to get. You hope that you can get that particular individual. Sometimes right about the time you think you're going to get them, somebody picks right ahead of you, then you've got to have to, you must make a, a last minute adjustment. But overall, the planning and the discipline and the overall format of uh, getting ready, ready for the draft is so well organized that really it isn't much of a problem. Is it much of a scramble, though, when somebody picks someone that maybe you were going to draft or that you had your hopes set on, you, you thought you had a good shot at getting them, somebody picks ahead of you, do you then scramble? Well, you have to be disciplined and prepared well enough to know that, you know, he might be taken. So everybody that you have, you have to say, well, we'll take him, but in the event that he's not available, we'll take him. So in the event that comes, you don't have that wild scramble. For and example, I, I'm sorry, Hank, for example, we saw St. Louis wait till the last second before making their pick. Well, it might have been that they were uh, talking to people about a trade mm -hmm. or uh, changing their draft picks or something of that nature. That, could, that doesn't necessarily mean that they didn't know who they wanted to get or wanted to take. It was just probably a, com a combination of things that they were involved with at the time. But basically, uh, you know, it's got to be the either or or thing. And uh, usually uh, the teams of the draft well are in that position where they know precisely if he's taken, we're going to take this fellow. If he isn't taken, we're going to take this one. And that's the way it has to work. Thank you very much, Hank Stram. Now back to Sal. OK, Sam, in terms of time, the 1981 draft is about an hour and a half old. We're still in the first round. We've had 16 picks. Not one defensive lineman has been picked. And uh, Pittsburgh is up next, and the Steelers uh, need help on the defensive line. Elsie Greenwood and uh, Joe Green will be 35 by the time the 1981 season uh, begins. Uh, a quick comment from Paul Zimmerman vis-a-vis -vis the Steelers. Uh, I only have two words to say about the Steelers, and that's Keith Gary. There's the pick from Paul Zimmerman. Keith Gary uh, of Oklahoma, regarded as uh, the premier pick for the Steelers coming up. Well, what do you think of Houston's Leonard Mitchell? He has Oakland written all over him. <laughs> all right, there you have it. We are waiting for the Pittsburgh Steelers to make their pick. If it should be Gary, remember the Steelers had only uh, something like 16 sacks all of last year, so you know they need some help at that juncture of the table. You can see the Pittsburgh Brain Trust here in New York, in particular Bobby McCartney, who's their director of film, and uh, he is heading up uh, the phone conversations as they try to put things together uh, back to Pittsburgh and try to uh, nail down this 17th pick on the first round. Let's head back to our broadcast center, Bob Lee and company. Let's recap exactly what's happened so far. Again, the top uh, three picks made within four minutes, George Rogers, Lawrence Taylor to the Giants, Freeman McNeil taking a uh, shot with the Jets now, the running back out of UCLA. Seattle going to Kenny Easley, St. Louis for EJ Jr., Rich Campbell, the quarterback from Cal, going to the Packers. The Bucks selecting Hugh Green, finally, the linebacker out of Pitt. San Francisco selecting Ronnie Lott out of USC. Mel Owens, the linebacker from Michigan, picked by the Rams. Cincinnati going for David Verser, the wide receiver out of Kansas. Keith Van Horn, the offensive tackle from USC, going to Chicago. McMillan, Randy McMillan, the fullback from Pitt, selected by the Colts. The Dolphins going for David Overstreet from Oklahoma. Willie Scott, the tight end out of South Carolina, was the selection of the Chiefs. Denver going for Dennis Smith out of USC. Detroit, Mark Nichols of uh, the wide receiver out of San Jose State. I'm Bob Lee here in the uh, broadcast center with Bud Wilkinson, Paul McGuire, and Howard Balzer. We've looked at the picks, Bud, from a coach's standpoint, who has done the best job of filling the, the, the glaring gaps that existed on some of these teams? Well, I think you're always uh, hopeful that you'll get the man you want. And the ones that stand out to me, I don't think the Tampa Bay felt Hugh Green would be there. And the fact that he was was a delightful surprise. Uh, Ronnie Lott going to San Francisco. Same and thing Oklahoma. 
Next up, Minnesota Vikings. Okay, there you have it. That was the commissioner, Pete Rosell, and as uh, Paul Zimmerman had indicated, Keith Gary, the defensive end from uh, Barry Switzer's Oklahoma Sooners, is picked by the Steelers, number 17, and this is the first round, so Keith Gary, defensive end for uh, Oklahoma, goes. Next up, Minnesota, Paul Zimmerman. Well, I'm on a streak now. Uh, there's no <laughs> slowing me down. <laughs> uh, I, I had gotten very little uh, indication from them what they would do. Uh, I projected Mark May, the big tackle uh, from Pittsburgh, but I think Brian Holloway of Sanford is still there, so uh, he might be the line pick. Uh, if they want to go big back, it would be Wilder uh, of Missouri. But I, I would guess the lineman may or Holloway. But I've been wrong before. We had to break away rather rapidly from Bristol in the broadcast center. Uh, Bud Wilkinson was in the middle of a thought in that one. Uh, Bob Lee is standing by at the broadcast center in Bristol uh, with their evaluation of what has transpired. 17 picks so far. Pittsburgh has just taken Keith Gary, the defensive end from Oklahoma. The clock running down there shows 13 minutes plus. And as it stands right now, this is for the Minnesota Vikings pick. 13 minutes and counting for the Vikings. Let's go back to the broadcast center and Bob Lee. Thank you very much, George. Grand and Bud, we were in mid-sentence before Keith Gary was selected by Pittsburgh. Again, your point that uh, who was making the best selection from a coaching standpoint in the first round. Well, from the standpoint of what they needed and what they hoped to have prior to the draft, and I think I was talking about Bill Walsh from San Francisco having the opportunity to get Lott to Southern California, who everybody believes is going to be an all-pro and is going to play some 10 years. I also think that Marv Levy at Kansas City is very, very happy because he needed a tight end badly, and he did get Willie Scott. Needs for the Minnesota Vikings, as we project now, they have the next pick, and they have uh, a good 12 minutes left. They need an offensive lineman, tight end, wide receiver. Paul, uh, to your mind, Richards has been mentioned out of Missouri as a possibility. Richards has been mentioned. If they need a tight end, I wouldn't be surprised to see Purdue's David Young go to Minnesota. I, I agree with Bud 100% on the Kansas City. Kansas City's been saying it since the end of the season. We want a tight end. Of course, Howard and I disagree because Howard thought that, you know, they did get a tight end, but they would get it in the second round. But they took it in the first round, and they took Willie Scott. You didn't see Scott Howard as a first-round selection. I, I thought this year there's, it's a good crop of tight ends, but it's not a, a super one where you had a one guy standing out like a junior Miller last year or Winslow a couple of years ago. I thought they could have gotten a wide receiver and then waited for one of those still pretty good tight ends in the second round. Marty McDowell is still available. I'm a little surprised he hasn't gone yet. Donnell Thompson, I thought the Steelers would take him. He really bulked himself up lifting the weights in the offseason. He's going to be a pretty good choice for a team. Minnesota taking next. I, I would think Holloway would be the pick. They need that big offensive tackle. And right now, I think that's what the Vikings will do. I, I don't think they really need a tight end. I don't think there's a first rounder sitting there at tight end right now, to be honest. Following the Vikings, the next selection following that belongs to New England. Then Washington, which has that pick which originally belonged to Los Angeles via the trade. Uh, there's still about uh, 10 minutes remaining for the, uh, the Vikings to make that selection. Oakland has two selections in this first round. Talk about people having Oakland stamped all over them. Uh, there is a, a unique uh, quality to Oakland players. We'll pick up on that point after we take this commercial break. Live and exclusive coverage of the 1981 NFL Draft here on ESPN. clock winding down 10 minutes and counting for the selection of the Minnesota Vikings the 18th pick overall in this first round of the National Football League draft just completed Pittsburgh has taken Keith Gary the defensive end from Oklahoma uh, the Vikings set to make their pick then after that the New England Patriots and after that the Washington Redskins the Vikings pick and then New England Paul Zimmerman well um, the Vikings don't take Donnell Thompson I'm pretty sure New England will uh, I don't think they thought he'd be available. Uh, they'll be very surprised if he is, and they'll be very happy about it because the uh, defensive line shows a lot of age, um, and they have to they have to get something done there. They indicated that they might even go Lomax if Thompson's gone just out of uh, uh, necessity of getting a, a, a good a good highly projected player, and then maybe trading him or uh, making sure it's for broken knees or whatever. But I think I think you can be sure they're going to take that defensive line. Okay, we are at the point now where this is the Minnesota Vikings pick, number 18. And number 19 will be the Washington Redskins. They were involved in that trade with uh, the Rams. It allowed the Rams to go from 20 to 9 to Washington. We'll get to the pick after New England. Minnesota, New England, Washington still to come. Oakland has two picks coming. Cleveland, Buffalo, San Diego, Dallas, Philadelphia, and Atlanta on this first round. Now, we've heard from the gallery here 
as uh, how the fans are evaluating. We have some experts as well as fans over at uh, one of the traditional football watering holes in New York City. That is Mike Minucci's restaurant. Chris Berman is there. Well, Berman, here's what's happening. Yeah. Well, George, I'll tell you, everybody here at Minucci's is using the uh, ESPN draft kit like uh, we are right here to write down all the picks. And Pat Garvey is with me, and he's been a season ticket holder of the New York Giants for, well, they used to have pillars in the stadium, didn't they? It's, uh, it's been a long time. It's the days of YA Tittle, but uh, I must say that I, I think Lawrence Taylor is an awfully good choice and probably indicative of the fact that the Giants are going to go to the 3-4 defense next year. Uh, the only problem with that is that you need a strong nose guard to play that defense. And the strongest no guard the Giants have had in years is now playing for the Detroit Lions and John Mendenhall. I yeah. uh, hate to sound cynical, but uh, the <laughs> Giants, Giants for the past decade have left us with many disappointments. And uh, it, I think the jury is still out on, on the remainder of the draft for the Giants. Pat, as a, as a Giant fan, the new Perkins Young regime, do you have a little more confidence that uh, Lawrence Taylor is not a cliff diver from Bermuda? <laughs> <laughs> That's Rocky Thompson you've got to be yeah. referring to. No, I, I think he's a blue chipper. Uh, last year, I think the, the draft was, was a bust for them. And I think two years ago in Perkins' first year with the... Uh, certainly with Sims and, uh, and Ernest Gray, I think that was a good draft for them. Uh, it remains to be seen what they draft in the rest of this round. It's a uh, sobering thought indeed to think that last year their, their two top choices probably were Haynes and Bruner, the quarterback, mm -hmm. and the quarterback they let go ended up on the Super Bowl Eagles, and the cornerback or defensive back they let go ended up on the Super Bowl Raiders. So uh, you got to question again what Perkins and Young are still up to with the Giants. Well, as a longtime fan of the Giants, where would you like to see them go? More defense the next couple of rounds? Um, I, I subscribe to the best athlete routine, but I think the Giants need so much help on offense that they certainly have got to start to look to offensive players, with the exception of uh, if they could get a good nose guard, but I don't think one exists in the draft this year. All right, I'll tell you, the Minnesota Vikings are next, then the New England Patriots, and if I just might throw in my two cents on the Patriots, uh, if they draft a defensive back, that'll be six number one picks, a defensive back, one of them is going to have to sell hot dogs. I think that's the way that's going to go. So we're going to see what Bucko Kilroy has up its sleeve with New England a little bit longer. Pat, let me ask you this. The, uh, the Giants fans in the past have burnt some tickets, even though they still sell out the place. You really feel a difference going to the games last year, that, that something was a little bit different, even though so many injuries in the free agents? Um, I must say last year I, I didn't feel so much that way because uh, Sims got hurt rather late in the season, and I think the impetus went out of the team. But... Uh, the, the year before that, I certainly felt that they were on the right track. I, I really have some doubts about where they're going, and they've renewed Perkins' contract, so they're obviously committed to him, and they're going to stick with him. They, uh, all right. They are committed to him, and we're committed to go back to the uh, draft headquarters at the Sheridan. Thank you, Chris. We are waiting on the 18th pick, the Minnesota Vikings. Uh, interesting. Uh, they mentioned Phil Sims. Of course, when he was selected, it was uh, somewhat of a ruffle, but now... Small college players and quarterbacks are familiar names. Let's go back to Oakland and Ron Barr and see what's transpiring on the West Coast view of this 81 draft. Thanks a lot, George. Well, for the last four years, I've been doing Stanford football play-by-play, -play, so I've seen a lot of Mark Nichols, the wide receiver that was drafted by Detroit. He's much like Stanford's Ken Marjoram. He's got the great speed and the great hands and great anticipation. He's 6'1", 211 pounds. The thing that the pros liked about him was he is a heady player. He'll go downfield. He'll take a look at a linebacker. He'll take a look at a defensive back. He'll read what they're going to do, and then he'll break into the open. He also has great anticipation. If his quarterback gets into trouble, he knows how to find the open slot. A lot of people are surprised here at Raider headquarters that Mark Nichols went in the first round. They expected him to go high in the second round. But again, he has that great intelligence, that great speed, great anticipation. He is definitely a very valuable player, and I think the Detroit Lions will find him very useful to their type of offense. That's it from Raider headquarters. Now let's go back to New York. The clock winds minutes down. Remaining. Four minutes and counting for the Minnesota Vikings in their first pick of this draft, the 18th pick in the first round. And on the floor... Sam Rosen is standing by, and he'll be uh, filling us in on the, the way people are evaluating the way this draft has gone so far uh, as we have gone through, this at this point, 17 different picks with the Pittsburgh Steelers taking last. They took Keith Gary, the defensive end, out of Oklahoma. Uh, we'll be, uh, of course, following the picture in Oakland as the afternoon progresses, as the morning and afternoon progresses. Oakland has two picks on this first round, number 21, which will come a couple of picks ahead, and then again, the uh, number 24 pick, so uh, Oakland will have a couple of shots at it during the course of the next uh, hour or so here in the 1981 draft. Let's go on the floor with Sam Rosen. Sam? Thank you very much, George, and I'm here with columnist Murray Kempton of Newsday. Murray, what brings you to the NFL draft? Well, I'm a New Yorker, you know, and the NFL draft 
is the only time when the New York team's ever ranked in the first three. <laughs> Some sleeper like New Orleans always comes in and pushes them out. And then I come to hear the Giant fans protest the draft. It's the only democratic procedure we have left in this city. And um, this year they sounded very happy. Yeah. It sounded like they, get, like they got the player they wanted. Well, they got what they read in the newspaper. Do you think, do you think the coaches draft from the newspapers? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. You Bernie think they listen to columnists? Well, I'll tell you one thing. I've been telling people how to pick presidents for years, and nobody's paying attention to me. And But these coaches just go faithfully right along with the newspaper picks. What do you think about this whole scenario? I think it's delightful. I don't want to plug you guys, but I think it's absolutely brilliant to have 12 hours of it. It's like a good congressional hearing. But it's... Uh, of course, the thing is that, like a lot of journalism, it's a little fraudulent. You look at these junior, junior assistants. I mean, all the heavy thinkers are all sitting in their suites, phoning them in. I think it would be a much better show if, you know, you came down here and watched Bud Grant freak out when he has three seconds left on the shot clock. <laughs> anyway, thank you. It's good seeing you. Thank you, Murray Kempton. Now back to George Grant. Okay, Sudden Sam with Murray Kempton. We get every angle of it here for the 1981 National Football League draft. Sal, uh, we're waiting on Minnesota's pick. Uh, so far, uh, we've uh, had uh, the running backs, the defensive backs, and the linebackers selected. How about the interior linemen? There's a, a center named John Scully out of Notre Dame who gets the highest rating from all the scouts. He's still available. Uh, perhaps Minnesota might go with uh, Scully. Scully uh, succeeded... Uh, uh, Dave Huffman, uh, when he went to the Vikings, and uh, they are projecting Scully perhaps as an offensive tackle. Uh, I, I want to ask our resident expert here, Paul Zimmerman, uh, what do you think about two that, two that, two that two possibility? Two I think tackles progress to the four centers. <coughs> I think centers are a little too limited. It's easier to take a tackle and project them to center than a center and project them to tackle. Why? Because tackle has to be a better athlete. He's out in the wide open spaces where he has those rushing ends and more territory to cover. Has to be quicker feet and better player. Well, they say Scully is very good downfield. Well, they got enough guys downfield. Okay. <laughs> All right, let me interrupt just for a moment. That's Stan Van Duzer, the director of uh, the uh, overall draft today here in New York. Uh, they may very well be working on a trade at this very moment as Minnesota's pick is up, the number 18 selection. Uh, Jan has uh, been on the phone with the folks there. Uh, he is walking across the room now. Let's see if we can uh, piece this trade together. Uh, he's over talking with Don Weiss and Jim Hepperton now. Uh, they have a card, so they have either a trade and a selection or possibly just the beginning of a trade as it unfolds here. Uh, we are close to two hours into the draft. We have gone through 17 picks. This is Minnesota's selection. Selection uh, number 18 in the draft thus far. Uh, now he's going over with the commissioner. We should explain that as much as possible, they try to reflect and uh, investigate each one of these movements as they occur. In other words, uh, if there's a trade for a draft pick, say, on the fourth or fifth round, they have uh, work here that has to be done. In other words, they have to see if that pick is available. They have to see if it wasn't traded before. Uh, so they try to do that as much as possible so that uh, they don't announce a pick and then maybe uh, a day later or two days later they find out that they couldn't have made that selection. So it takes a little bit of time to do that. Uh, that's Jan Van Duzer's job to make sure that that is done and done before the selection uh, is announced. It is pretty obvious at this point that something is working as Jan Van Duzer and the clock runs out. Let's go to Vikings. Vikings trade their first round choice to the Baltimore Colts. Minnesota will receive Baltimore's second choice in this draft, which comes as the 11th pick in the second round. They will also receive from Baltimore a second round pick that Baltimore had acquired from Washington by way of LA, which is the 24th selection in the second round. So Baltimore trades its first round choice Rather, Minnesota trades its first round choice to Baltimore for the two seconds. Brian Holland. Brian Holland. Plus, plus a fifth, there's a third choice involved, I'm sorry. The third choice that Minnesota received from Baltimore is Baltimore's fifth round choice, which is the 12th pick on the fifth round. So Minnesota received two seconds and a fifth for this first round choice 
of Minnesota, Baltimore, on Minnesota's selection in the first round, Colts take Jernell Thompson, defensive oh. tackle, University of North Carolina. Okay, there you have it. The commissioner announcing it again. Uh, to reiterate, Dan Van Duzer sitting there with the commissioner, making sure that it is uh, All right, next verified. Team selecting in the first round. Uh, that is Danelle Thompson for Baltimore. Uh, the Colts take Danelle Thompson, uh, and that uh, in the trade, Minnesota trades uh, three picks all told: two second-round picks and a fifth-round pick. Uh, they pick up from Baltimore. The Colts will select Danelle Thompson as the 18th player on this the first round. The New England Patriots are up next. The defensive tackle from North Carolina, Danelle Thompson, uh, selected by the Baltimore Colts on this the first round. We'll be back with more of ESPN's live and exclusive coverage of the 1981 National Football League Collegiate Player Draft after this word. We are back at the uh, New York Sheridan Hotel, the site of the NFL draft. I'm here with Carrie Roselle, the wife of Commissioner Pete Roselle. How many drafts is this for you? This is my eighth, Sam. And, and uh, I love it. It's fun. Now, what about the... Oh, I think your husband is about to make the next announcement. I hope it's not as complicated as the last. New England Patriots. Patriots first round selection. Brian Holloway, tackle Stanford. Next up, Washington Redskins on the choice exchange with the Rams. What's it like in your household coming up to the draft? I would say it's probably a little confusing because nine times out of ten we have uh, a lot of people in the neighborhood are calling and saying who's going to be the first round pick and so on and so forth. And I think this year particularly with uh, the Giants having the second pick, and the Jets having the third pick. You know, people are interested, and they think, of course, we've got all the answers. They're wrong. <laughs> we don't. Do you plot out the draft yourself? No. <laughs> no, I must admit, that is one thing I don't do. <laughs> you and the commissioner talk about uh, who you think will be drafted? Well, I, I think like most people, I think we discuss what the top picks will be, and I think that also, because we're New Yorkers, we're interested in what's going to happen in our own city. And uh, then, of course, when you've got somebody like George Rogers, everybody talks about that. He's so special. So it's always an exciting time. Always. Always. It's never dull. And uh, I, we always have a lot of kids in the neighborhood who want to come to the draft. I feel like I should be selling tickets. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Carrie Roselle, wife of Commissioner Pete Roselle. Now let's go to Bob Lee at Sports Center in Bristol. Thank you very much, Sam. So we went actually some 16 selections into the first round of this year's NFL draft before a true defensive lineman was selected. Pittsburgh on the 17th pick going to Keith Gary. Donnell Thompson, the selection from Baltimore. Next up, <coughs> Oakland Raiders on a choice of change from Houston. Okay, in case you missed that one, in case you missed uh, the tail end of it, Pete Rozelle uh, was making the selection, the Washington selection. They took Mark May, the offensive tackle from Pittsburgh. So uh, two offensive linemen back-to-back. -back. Uh, it was expected uh, that the uh, likes of Holloway and May would go pretty uh, fast. And as it stands now, three offensive linemen have been taken. Holloway... To New England on 19, and the most recent Washington picked in the 20th slot, Mark May, the tackle from Pittsburgh. Bob, uh, I know that uh, you folks up there uh, have been looking at this. I know uh, in particular Howard Balzer uh, uh, liked both uh, Holloway and May coming into this draft. Not only did he like uh, Holloway and May coming into the draft, but just before the Patriots made their selection, not to put on our 2020 hindsight, but you were explaining the logic prior to the selection, why the Pats would make such a move. Well, they made that trade a couple of years ago when they traded Leon Gray to Houston, and they had plugged in Dwight Wheeler as the offensive tackle, and he really hasn't performed up to those great expectations. So when a lot of the players have been gone that maybe New England would have liked, it was a logical thing for him to take one of those top offensive tackles. And they took, they chose Holloway and Washington coming up next. I had them taking Holloway if he was still there, so they just went for Mark May, who I thought might have gone earlier. But of course, as we know, they're always a gamble. But Leonard Mitchell is still sitting there, and, <laughs> and Oakland's up. Oakland's up. I don't think they'll take him right now. They could take him if he's still there in the, 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 the later picks. <coughs> Excuse me. I think they're going to take a wide receiver now. McDowell is still there, or possibly Chris Collins will. As we were saying earlier, we went 16 picks before finally a, a true defensive lineman was selected. Uh, Pittsburgh selecting Keith Gary, Donnell Thompson on the 18th selection, Paul selected by Baltimore. 
Well, I think th the thing that we have to consider here is that talking to some of the coaches discussed, there aren't that many true defensive ends coming out of college. Most of these defensive linemen are defensive tackles. They're going to try to convert some of them, but the majority of them are defensive tackles, and that's kind of strange coming out of college football. And Thompson is a nose guard, goes six four and a half, uh, 260 out of North Carolina with 4'9 speed. He finally really lived up to his reputation this past year. Can uh, get through those blockers, make the move, defensive tackle and or nose guard as we see with 87 total tackles. Bud? I think it's very interesting. It depends on the ability of position, but uh, you have six of the first nine picks. Defensive linemen, linebackers, pardon right. me, and defensive secondary people. Six of the first nine. That's where you lose football games. Line